All right, I think we're live and I hope you all are doing good. We are in the heart of our spring season and there is pollen coming in like crazy. Nectar has come in. We're getting nectar shakes in the honey production yards. It's an awesome time of the year. We're going to talk a lot about swarming. We're going to talk about splits. Any question that you have that I can get to, we will address it in this talk. Hope you all are having a good first day of the week. All right, so here in Tennessee, we are experiencing what I think is about a two-week delay on bloom. I'm seeing wild cherries that are near the end of their bloom, but this is late. Autumn olives late. Um, it's just finished up. I haven't seen any black locust yet. I'm just starting to see the beginnings of stuff on tulip poplar. The snowflowers, aka fringe facilia, they're going. I, I just, everything seems to be behind a little bit as far as the nature side of things go, but the bees seem to be kind of going along with that. I mean, it doesn't look like the bees are behind. It's just bloom time is behind and so far so good. Actually, I would say that we're having a nice season. I want, I'm not, I don't know where it's going to go from here. We're hoping a good honey crop here. We'll see. Todd Prater, good to see you on. Still can't fire up my bull crap smoker. Well, you know, you get what you pay for. <laughs> hey, Jonathan Stevens, thanks for from for coming on all the way from Maine. Hope you guys are starting to warm up a little out there, and getting a couple of pollen flights in. Uh, if that's uh, already happening up there, I don't know what you all's weather is like. I imagine it's quite a bit cooler. My dad's actually been up to Maine two times, I believe, since January. Um, for his job and has found it um, quite a nice place to visit and says the seafood up there is awesome. And my dad's no stranger to seafood. He was born right off the Gulf in Alabama. So you guys must have some good stuff up there. All right. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. Hope you guys are doing good. A lot to talk about today. And I guess before we get started, I'm waiting for uh, some questions. I'll just start saying a thing or two about what's going on around here. Nebraska, all right, they come in from everywhere. My crap smoker won't light. What's wrong, Kate? <laughs> well, since then, I've gotten some comments about what I should have done differently, and I'm sure there are ways to light um, crap. But, you know, I just i am not really skilled in that art form. I mean, my wife never said it was one I needed, and so if Laurel doesn't tell me what to do, I, I usually pretty helpless. <laughs> I think I, I did crumble it up towards the end. We did delete quite a bit of footage out of it because it just, it was so unepic. I was really surprised how hard it was to get it to light. It seemed very dry on the inside as well. It had been sitting, I'm drying out for a very long time. So several people suggested I get some you know, hay or some wood started first and then put the manure on top, which I guess that i mean that, that probably would work that's how you start fires is with you know lighter easier to burn stuff and work your way to the big stuff but if it's going to take that much to burn it's going to be hot and that kind of defeats the purpose of why would i use manure unless i just had to that's my thoughts but then again uh there's a lot of people in the world hey brian thank you so much uh for supporting us yet again i hope you're doing good there in jersey and I'm hoping to run into you here in, what is it, about a month? I believe you're coming out to Kentucky, and uh, if, if possible, we're going to meet up again. And uh, got some wax dip boxes if you still need those. That's actually when that video I did today, all those boxes that were behind me, those are going to be wax dip. And that's not the half of them. Quite a bit. Hi from Maine. What's your favorite honeybee? All right, big question. So. Favorite honeybee? Well, I like the ones that make honey and don't sting a lot and survive the winters well, all that kind of stuff. But I know you're talking more specific than that. Italian, carnies, hybrids, buckfast, um, whatever you want to call it. Here in the United States, all of our bees are intermixed pretty decent. So we breed based off of characteristics, really, as opposed to pure, pure breads. There are some programs that have pretty pure bees, but still everything has is, is got some 
um, diversity in it. And it's actually really important that bees have that. Um, carnies, I tend to lean towards liking because of one thing in particular is that they shut down here in Tennessee. So one thing you have in Maine that we don't is a real winter. Our winters are kind of so-so. This is actually a pretty good winter for us this year. We had four halfway decent snows this year. That was about four more than what we get a lot of years. Um, so if our bees don't have a brood break in winter time, then if I'm trying to use oxalic acid or a product to really eradicate the mites down to a low number in winter, then I, I can't do it because the, the we can't get to the mites in the brood very good. Uh, Italians during a mild winter here would still have about three quarters to a frame of brood in January and especially in December, which made cleaning up the mites with oxalic acid very difficult. So that's one of the reasons I like the carnies. I guess another reason would be is that they're more sensitive to flows. This can be a con though, if let's say there is no flow and they're young and you don't feed them enough, they'll shut down heavily. It's harder to get them sometimes to build back up. Uh, um, but I do like that as they, they seem to be more conservative with the, sort, the stores that they have. So I like carnies a little bit better, but I've run Italians longer than I've run carnies and did really well with those two. Italians just tend to eat more. And I think where you're at, probably carnies would be better because they do have some characteristics, I think, that make them better for wintering, in my opinion. All right. Getting back up to some questions. So Dan's got some pollen in Wisconsin. All right. Up there. Cold, cold. Oh, we got someone from Germany. All right. Thanks for coming on, Stonewall. Yeah, I, I really hate it for Ian. It just seems like this year it's just been one gut punch after the other. I did talk to him the other day, and he said that his bees were in really good shape. And hopefully, the, after all this is done, the, the canola flows and everything ends up working out pretty good. All right, so we got another Reese on here. Mark Reese from Reese Farm. All right. Rylan Pina says... Um, how long does it take for an average hive to eat a one pound pollen patty? All right, there's some variables here. So if it's a strong colony, they'll eat it very quickly. But if there's a lot of pollens coming in, a lot of nectar coming in, they will focus on the real stuff first and then they will eat that too. But it'll be a lot slower than if they didn't have those other things preoccupying their attention. Because when the nectar flow is done for the day, it's just not, they don't just stick it in a cell and they're done for it. Woo, we offloaded that and we are done. During the honey flow time of the season, they have to pass it from one bee to the other, ripen it up, fan it down, and you know, drones will take it. They have to kind of organize things throughout the evening, so it takes a lot of their attention from things like pollen patties. A lot of has to do with it as well as what brand of pollen patty it is and what's the texture. Is it a harder type or is it more of a soft patty? How much access can they get to it and how healthy your bees are? Bees that are struggling with anything, whether it be EFB, whether it be mites, whether it be a poor queen that's not laying good. Any factor that is keeping the bees percentages from being as close to 100% as possible is going to impact how your bees take feed syrup or pollen patties. So whenever I go through a yard of, let's say, 40 colonies, this could apply to five colonies, 10 colonies, and I'm feeding them all the same, and there's one or two that aren't eating at the same rate, and they, they look like they should be, that's an indication immediately I need a further inspection. Why is this colony not eating the same way the rest of them are? Healthy bees love to eat. So a pound on a good, strong, double deep, I would expect that to be gone in about four or five days. Depends on temperature too. So access, temperature, lots of variables. Also, you know, how much surface area is there? You can take a rectangular patty, break it into four pieces and kind of spread it out just a little bit so the bees can get in between it. We do that a lot here in small hive beetle country because uh, the bees do need to eat it as quickly as they possibly can. If you have small hive beetles, just be careful. 
All right, someone from Iowa, Massachusetts, all over the place tonight. Hope you all are doing good. Getting to some questions here. Sorry about the video, everybody, today. I really thought it was going to be educational. I thought we actually were going to have, you know, this isn't, you know, it's going to be goofy, but it was also going to be, hey, we're going to light this smoker um, with manure and it's going to work out good and there'll be a takeaway. It, it felt like, uh, eh, it was, it, it just was. I did a split a month ago. Now I have lane workers, but there are two capped queen cells. What will happen? Eh, there's not a good chance that that's going to be um, a success. If they have lane workers, then they're probably trying to raise something off of nothing. And sometimes they'll still try to raise some queens off of um, some of those worker eggs, but nothing good's going to happen. Honestly, if there's a lane worker situation, I'm going to combine those with another colony um, as, as soon as I can, because I don't want them changing all my worker cells into drone size cells. And that's what they'll do is, is they laid those infertile eggs into those cells they will widen on those worker cells to drone size to accommodate those drones as they develop and i don't want to ruin my comb and just do a paper combine just newspaper in between a good colony and that one and and split later definitely don't buy a queen and waste a queen on it because they will kill her probably 90 something times out of 100. all right hi from alaska hi from maine what's your favorite Honey, all right. So my favorite honey, that's like asking me, what's my favorite band? I mean, that would be very difficult to answer. So, hmm, Tupelo is really good. I really like the honey we produce here. I, I think it's a nice, um, got a light flavor, but it's not real light. And so it's got some character. It's not perfect. Um, you know, Chiave is really a novelty, but it's not my favorite flavor. Uh, my favorite combo is Chiave honey with vanilla bean. Ooh, so good. Uh, my friend um, David on the Big Island of Hawaii with Good Job Bees, um, he's got a website and everything. He produces some very pure Chiave honey that naturally crystallizes and puts vanilla bean in it, and that is that is good. Um, uh, you know, I got some honey from several of you all. I'm, I'm planning to build a shelf behind me up here and have like the American flag, like have the shelf going around the flag if I can ever get time to do it. And that would be really cool to have the honey displayed back there. I just haven't had the time. But, you know, people have sent me their own um, flower, um, wildflower honey, and I've had several really good ones. I just love honey. And some of them are really good for barbecue sauces and not so much for biscuits. Basswood honey is really good. It's not my favorite, but it is a good honey. Is a walkaway split a good way to split my hive? Well, it can be if the queen comes back. There's a lot of variables. And so what I would like to point out is it takes about 50 days from the time you make that walk away split till the time they have new bees from that new queen to emerge. That's almost two months. And that's if things work out good. If there's some weather delays, we could be talking another five days. Maybe more, maybe less, you know, maybe in ideal conditions, it'd be 48 days or something like that. But it approximately takes 50 days for a walk away split for a once from when you make the split for the queen to emerge from the cell, then they build a cell, her to emerge from the cell, go on a mating flight, come back, learn how to lay, lay, go from that point to the brood emerging. That's 50 odd days until you, that colony is going to move forward. And what you're losing during that time is possibly prime part of the season to draw new combs out. You're also losing a bee population that you could be use, utilizing a bigger population to capture more pollen. And if you're in an area like I have where you have a dearth in July and August, sometimes part of June, and if you have a bad fall, sometimes part of September, then that means less pollen stored in the cone. That means it's going to be harder for them to maintain a big population going through summer. 
which will impact how many bees that are to forage the fall flow. Now, maybe you're not in an area like that, but maybe you're way up north and you have a short abbreviated season. So this is why I don't do walk away splits. Um, there are people who do them successfully. I just don't find that they work super, super well for me. I've also learned how to raise my own queens. So it makes it a little bit easier in that regard. The other thing, if I was going to do a walk away split, though, I wouldn't literally just do a walk away split. I would, in the walk away split, have a frame of eggs. I would mark that frame and I would come back carefully three days later. And they should be drawn a bunch of queen cells at this point. And I would go through every frame and any frame that has cells on it that's not the egg frame, the cells need to be crushed. And that way we know that we get a queen raised from that egg area. Because what will happen is when you make a split without a queen, they're not in what a swarm mode or anything like that. They're raising queens from an, an emergency standpoint. And sometimes bees in this emergency mode will raise a queen from larvae that are actually too old. They've been fed a little bit of worker jelly, which is a little different and will suppress their ability to become a good queen. So you don't want that to happen. If you do it, put some eggs in there, mark that frame, eliminate any other cell. That's a little bit more work, which kind of defeats some of the purpose of a walkaway split, but that's just my opinion on it. And I think um, it, it's probably a good idea to ensure you get a good queen there. And then also monitor. Let's see, let's calculate this out. If we're raising them from eggs, they're going to hatch from an egg in a couple days. So let's say, say three days if it's a brand new spanking egg and they make that queen from. So we're, we're talking about we don't want to come back 16 days from egg lay to the time the queen emerges. And then we're going to calculate another 15 odd days. So when we make this walk away split, we don't want to check it for probably about 32 days. Maybe wait 35, honestly. 32 to 35 days from a walk away split, check it. And if we've got brood in there, then, then we're good. If we don't have brood in there, we combine it back because um, chances are that they're not going to come back with the queen. But anyways, that's just my opinion. I'm not a walk away split expert. That is for certain. Maybe some people here in the chat can talk to you about it a little bit more than I can. All right. So Terry Chapman with Guardian Bee Apparel has the best customer service I've seen. Loving the new jacket I got from them. Well, I actually just talked to Terry um, the other day about our Hive Life conference. He's, you know, gearing up for another year. They they had a, you know, good time and um, it was it was really neat. I've never seen really a conference where they had someone like Terry come out, and um, it was really his idea. So I appreciate that of him where he's like. We'll bring sizes and people can try them on and see what size fits them for them good and we'll ship them free to their door and like i think it was 15 percent off um, with the conference discount so that was cool and i see you have um you came to our conference sweet harlan honeybees so hey thanks for coming we appreciate you very much and uh, uh you saw what we did last year well we're gonna blow that out of the water for sure James McNally, anyone seen the last video from Inside the Hive? I almost clicked that, and then I realized I had to get ready for this chat. He was talking about fungus to help control Varroa thoughts on biological solutions. I'll have to watch that video. So far, most biological solutions like fungus has not its made out, out of a Petri dish into a hive product. Um, that would be nice if it would. Bebum, what type of mating nukes do you prefer? That's his question. So I like three frame mating nukes. And I like deep frames. Now, if you're using medium frames, then maybe four medium frames or something like that. But I don't like having, I, I've tried everything from mini nukes to this, this, and that, half frames, all that kind of stuff. I really like keeping them in the same type of equipment that I like to use. It makes it so much easier to make them, and it makes it so much easier to combine back when they fail. And there will be some that fell. The two-frame mating nuke is too small, in my opinion. A two-frame mating nuke is just either teetering on the point of being taken over down here by small high beetles or something. 
and not being able to take care of itself or it's blowing out of the two frames in quick fashion. The three frame gives me more time to be able to adjust. And if they get too strong, I pull a frame out and put a drawn comb in it. Or if the next colony, like mine are three, three framers. So it's a 10 frame box with two dividers, three, three, and three. So if I have two queens come back, they're going to be strong. And if this one you know, doesn't come back, then obviously it's going to be weak. So the, if one of those is a little too strong, then we'll just pull a frame out of it, make sure we don't take the queen and drop it in the one that didn't have a queen come back. So it balance out the populations. And then when we've harvested all the queens from those to use in either to sell or something else, we will um, then drop queen cells in all three and we're back in business. But you can use a five frame mating nuke for queen rearing too. But honestly, queen rearing, um, a lot of times we get real fancy with it. I, I personally, I just like keeping it simple on the queen rearing equipment. I think many nukes make sense if you're a commercial operation, but I, I just, I never liked them. They were always very frustrating for me to use. They were either perfect or absconding. And that was, that was it. I purchased a number of bees in a 10 frame box with a three inch wood spacer above frames in one week. They have built comb from top frames to the bottom of the lid. What's going on? Okay. So this means you need to get the bees more space. Um, bees will grow out of a 10 frame box fairly quickly if they're strong and they will need two boxes. This is the bees way of letting you know that um, there's a flow going on. Maybe you're feeding or, or there's just a natural nectar flow going on and bees will build what's called burr comb on top of those top bars, Marine vet, when they need more room to store that honey. The problem is if they run out of room and they start backfilling the, the brood nest with pollen or nectar and the queen has no more room to lay, this triggers swarming oftentimes. So you need to get in there, make sure you don't have any swarm cells and add another box. This is what it sounds like to me. Advice on keeping a builder from pulling down accepted cells, 90% accepted, 50% finished. Well, the best way to do that is to get an incubator and pull them out about day seven from graft. And that really fixes it really easy there. Um, otherwise, just having a, a, a bigger population usually will accept more cells. And so that really impacts things. Nutrition and good bee population, nurse bee population will keep more cells. But the best way to avoid all of that is, is an incubator. And I know that there, it's an additional cost, but they last a long time in my experience and uh, they really pay for themselves if you're raising a good bit of queens even just a halfway decent bit of queens if it saves you five queens over the year then goodness it's paid for itself and you got a good incubator i i like really the, the one from uh cutler bee supply they came to our conference as well and they had it on discount and it's, it's a good incubator bob uses i think four of them i've got one and another type of incubator and i i really like it very simple works good Hmm. Hello from Baxter. When do you usually get your first honey? So you're not too far away then, SS uh, or S. Swafford. Um, so we usually pull our honey in June, but this year's looking to be different. We're about two weeks behind as far as the bloom date is. Um, that's fine. The bees um, seem to be working along with it. Bees are a little bit behind, but so is the flow. So they seem to be right where they both need to be. Um, I haven't seen any late frost that have damaged anything. So that's awesome. I'm expecting a good honey flow year that can always change, but I'm expecting a late bloom. So in a warm year, we might pull honey supers by the second week of June. I'm going to guess that we're not going to pull supers this year until July, but don't wait any longer than that. In my opinion, you can pull earlier than that. They'll have some capped honey probably by mid to late May if they're a strong colony. So if, you know, whenever it's capped, you technically can pull it off and should be pretty good. We check ours with the refractometer just to be uh, safe, but, you know, you can get honey in May here. No problem. I've got bees that have 
the equivalent of about three or four mediums full of honey right now. The honey flows just started up and the, the best yards are starting to produce some good honey. And I suspect here in the next week or two that I'll probably have at least a medium full of honey to go. But I pull mine all off at the same time. But it is important that whenever the flow is done to get those supers off quickly, this is so that you can focus on mite control and, and killing those darn mites. All right, more questions. Last week, I asked about queen rearing in a small urban operation. You pointed me towards your queen rearing videos. Thanks. Watch them and then order JZBZ stuff and tools. Trying it for the first time soon. Hey, thanks for watching our video. And if you have any questions on those, um, just comment, of course. And as far as the cell builders and the whole queen rearing process, grafting does take a little bit of get any used to, but actually it's typic the mistakes are typically in the area of not enough nurse bee population. If it's a five frame nuke, I want about seven frames worth of bees in there. It's got to be packed. And then when you're done with it, you can leave a queen behind, a queen cell or two, or if you have three extra cells, leave them all in there. And then that's a nice colony. And so populations, number one, nutrition's number two. I give them a little bits of pollen patty. I make sure to have a frame of bee bread in there, at least one frame of bee bread. And that frame of bee bread is going to be next to the grafts. So those nurse bees can just go one frame over, get that bee bread, and go right to those um, queens. And really, those are the two main things. Grafting, um, you will get better the more and more you do it. But those, are, And also give them a little bit of thin syrup. Have one frame of foundation in there. Feed them really thin syrup. Even if there's a flow going on, I go ahead and feed them anyways. About three quarters of a pound of sugar to one pound of water. Those bees need to know that there's never going to be any type of hiccups in their nutrition and just go full on out on those queens. Okay, good questions, good questions. Hi, I'm a new beekeeper. I'm getting into grafting now. I wanted to know what is the right amount of bees to raise 30 cells? I made in number. Um, thank you. So if I'm wanting to raise 30 cells, Probably you can you can do it with a five frame nuke. It's a little trickier because they won't like to keep that many. They'll they may actually take they may not all actually take, but then after a while they may chip away at them a little bit. I don't know exactly why bees do this. Um, they just feel like maybe that's just too many. I don't know, but you can do multiple rounds as as well. Um, if you're wanting to do 30 in just one round, then I would make a strong 10 frame starter finisher. And, or you could do a starter and a finisher. Bob Benny has a good video on a starter and a finisher um, using a double screen board. There's a lot of different ways to raise queens. You can use um, a starter finisher where it's all in one hive. And if that's the case, a packed 10 frame colony will work really good. Hi, new to beekeeping. I just found Varroa in my new hive, two months old nuke. I live in Northern California. What's the best course of treatment in your opinion? Oxalic acid vapor or Aprovar? Thank you. Okay, so interesting. I've um, got some mites in California. So you've got brood. Oxalic acid only kills for a couple days and does not kill any mites that are in the brood. And most of the mites are hiding in the brood. So if you're going to do oxalic acid, you can do that, but you probably need to treat every other day for probably 10 rounds in order to get massive um, mite suppression. And there's some studies coming out showing that that actually works pretty decent, but that's a lot of treatment. Um, you could do a little bit of a combination and you could do some oxalic acid. And then when you're done with that, do ape of R2. It's important to get these mites under control Otherwise, your colony um, won't go very far. But um, good job seeing the mites and just watch out for them. Unfortunately, sometimes when you buy nukes, uh, there can be a decent bit of mites in them. Same way with packages, too. Um, I, I knew a guy, I know a guy, who got three packages last year from a treatment-free operation, treated them with oxalic acid at the end of it. 
and had like hundreds, if not thousands of mites fall off the packaged bees. So if you are still getting packages, any of you guys are getting packages, after you have popped the cork in the queen cage, pop that out, and then you can come back about eight days, eight or nine days afterwards, and you should be good to treat with oxalic acid. You can do it a little sooner than that. I like to give the queen about seven or eight days, get it to where she's laying, and that helps her pheromones out to a degree. But we don't want to give her enough time to where that brood of hers will be capped. From the time that she lays to the time that it is capped, they cap it on day nine. So if when we take the cork out, they're going to release the queen in about a day, typically. And she won't start laying good for a day or two. So probably give it about nine, eight or nine days after that. And then you can hit that oxalic acid in those packages before that brood is capped and kill a very large percentage of the mites. It's a good idea to start your bees fresh um, with low mite counts. So Tom, Todd Prater, what do you use when you run out of Apigard cards, wax paper on a three by five card? Um, you can go to like a dollar store and get, oh, let's see. Yeah, here's one right here. I use these all the time for making lists and sticking them in my pocket and I'll lose them. And so you can get these cards right here. You can make little notes on them and, and stuff on what to do and or write messages to the Varroa mites like um, incoming and those kind of things. And then put the APA guard on that. And the bees do a good job of tearing these up as opposed to some of the other materials and then get spitting them out of the hive in small pieces. So I do like that. Cayman, when you're doing splits, do you have a better tank using queen cells or virgin queens? Totally, totally queen cells. Um, I'm not really a big fan of virgin queens. If I can avoid it, I'll use them if I have to. And virgin queens can do pretty good, but they usually only do really good in small colonies or in larger colonies during a flow. When you get into the dearth period or into some bigger colonies, and you can have some issues, but... Um, Queen cells are way more accepted, and a lot, I, I prefer that big time. But there are guys who use virgin queens um, and, and do it well, but it's, it's a little bit more of a fine art, and you really got to have it dialed in on everything and then know kind of your flows, and, it, and queen cells is a lot more forgiving. Ian maybe could ship a whole truckload of pasture patties to Cayman. He could start a sideline Cayman's Organic Turd Smoker Fuel. I don't know. That just doesn't come off the tongue quite right. Cayman's Organic Turd Smoker Fuel. We're going to have to work on the, the terminology on that, John Hatch. But I just don't, I, you know, I'm big about supporting American jobs. So why am I going to get turds from Canada? It sounds, from what I've been able to see from YouTube, they, they have already a lot of turds in Canada. So we don't need any more. Um, we have enough turds down here in America, too. We don't need any Canadian turds. <laughs> Sorry, just can't help it. I'm in, a, I'm in an odd mood today. So Sweet Harlan Honeybees said they, they did their first graphs on the 13th of April with a five-frame nuke set and got 21 out of 30 cells. Awesome. That's good to hear. It's funny. Okay. So I'm scrolling up, making sure I'm not missing anything. Have you ever had any in infused hot pepper honey you like? Jalapeno, ghost pepper, and so on. You know, I, I'm not a spicy person um, in multiple ways. Um, I don't like spicy, real spicy foods, like a little bit of spice, but sweet and spicy, um, especially hun like honey. I just... To me, I, I think it had to be done right. I just haven't had it the right way. Gus sells hot honey down in Memphis, and people really like it. So, but I, everyone else in my family likes spicy stuff but me. Yes, I did wash my hands after the last video. I did. Oh, hey, Ian's on. That Taco Bell turd gave off a lot of smoke. I, I don't know why it didn't work so good. I mean, I ground it up later, and there's some stuff I didn't even show in the video. I I mean, I had the creosote 
my smoker is a lot more clean. That's that's for sure. The smoker I was using in that video is almost 20 years old, and man, that that's that's still my best smoker. I had to change the bellows out, but that that Danit smoker is awesome. It's my favorite thing Danit makes. I'm uh, my that's one thing I do buy from them. How long do I have to wait to graft queens after I see drones? Well, if you have drones already walking around in the colony and a halfway decent amount of them, then go ahead and graft. You should be good. Um, if you don't have any drones yet, but you have drone cells, then you want to wait till they're in about the purple-eyed stage. And so you'd have to actually uncap some of those drone cells to be able to see what stage they're in. But if you already have uh, quite a good bit of drones walking around, then yeah, you can go ahead and raise queens. I need to move my only hive about 15 yards. How would you do this task? Hmm. Well, some people like stick it on a little cart. If you have like a little wagon, that's you know, one of those sturdy ones and put it on that and they'll move it a few feet every day or two. And then the bees will just kind of move along with it. If you move them all at once, a lot of the forager bees will go back to that location uh, honestly, I I don't really run into those issues so much because even when I do move a colony, a lot of times there's other ones nearby. And so those bees will just drift into those other colonies. And so it's not that big of a deal to me. But that one is kind of a, you could just move them and they'll have to figure it out and see what happens. I mean, honestly, that's probably what I would do. And you can stick a box with a comb in it or something and, move them over of an i don't know it's it's it sounds some people will put like some branches over it once they move it of a night so the next day they have to do an orientation flight you could do it right before a rain like the night and you're gonna have a rain rainy day or two or a couple days i don't know where you're at if you have cold weather coming up where the bees can't fly and you're like it's not they're not gonna be able to fly for two or three days that would be great uh, a lot of times they haven't gotten out for a few days they do a lot of orientation flights and kind of reset so kind of kind of a little pickle there. What makes some bees requeen more often than they should? Bees that are out of balance and bees that have issues. Old bees, you can give them a wonderful queen that's been doing an amazing job and is young and got all the characteristics you'd want. And an old bunch of bees will kill that queen after she's laid for a couple of days and think that they can raise their own and do it better. Um, it does, it's just a colony that's really out of balance. Problem colonies like that get recombined to a bigger colony as long as they don't have any disease or high mite loads. And then if, if they don't have any brood, just hit them with some oxalic acid or a treatment before you combine them. Might as well just clean up the mites in them and combine them back. And then if you want to make a split, you make it from that colony or a colony and make a balance split. Balance splits are way better about accepting queens than a hive that's gotten old. Old bees don't accept queens good. I have a really bad case of chalk brood here in Australia. Tried managing to no avail. It's too late to requeen. Should I euthanize the colony to prevent spread or hold out until spring then requeen? Um, yeah, that sounds like you're at the end of your season there in Australia. Um, definitely don't want to give it to something else. Um, euthanize. Um, hmm. I wonder if, I don't know if you guys have formic acid there because you don't really have mites now, do you? See, I'd be like, I'd hit them with formic or something like that. Honestly, if they're just going to perish anyways, the last thing I want to do is get that to spread. That's a hard decision to make, but um, probably over here, what I would do is, is hit them with a full dose of formic acid and just nuke everything in that hive. Um, it won't kill the bees necessarily, but it'll nuke a lot of pathogens. And then if they die during the winter, stick the combs in the freezer. And I Honestly, I don't know. I've never had a bad, bad case of chalk brood. Usually, yeah, requeening is the best um, approach. Um, ge genetics. Genetics are the best way to deal with chalk brood, in my opinion. Sometimes you still have some issues. I remember a couple of years ago, last year was a good honey year for us, but the year before, 
it, we've just had the worst spring ever. And I have bees that are bred to be really resistant to EFB and chalk brood because any of them that show any signs of it, even little signs are eliminated immediately from selection. And then I purchased some queens from a guy who's even more meticulous than I am about it, uh, Michael Palmer in Vermont. So that's one of the reasons I like his is he's really focused on that. And there's a couple other guys I purchased from that are really into hygienic bees. So, but when it, that year, even in bees, I saw hardly any signs of EFB at all. And chalk, as soon as we just had some terrible weather, I mean, it just got cold and then it rained for like seven days straight. The bees nutritionally went backwards. It got really cold at night, late freeze, all that stuff. And I saw a, a good bit of EFB crop up. It wasn't real bad, but it was more than what I usually see. The bees were just stressed out. But once things warmed back up and the nutrition came in, those genetics, the hygienic behavior was able to catch back up and it cleaned it right on out. That, you know, as beekeepers and as a beekeeper that raises our own bees, we can't prevent all bad things from happening to our bees, but the, but we can make the problems lesser if we have bees for that. So I, I know I went past your question about two miles on answering that, but um, honestly, yes, euthanizing them, something like that would probably be the approach that I would take because you don't want to infect the rest of your bees. I remember purchasing some queens from a commercial operation in Georgia many years ago. And I mean, I was driving a truck. I purchased 100 of them because I just didn't have time to raise queens. I knew how to raise them. I just didn't have the time. I was driving five and a half days a week and then needed that day and a half to kind of recuperate and spend time with the family and in that day and a half to make the splits. And those queens within just a month, I had so much EFB in those hives. And I'll never order from that company again. But um, it was it was a it was bad bit of a, uh, a AFB EFB, and I'd never had it in those colonies before. Can drones see you when their eyes are purple? I I don't know. I I, I doubt it, but who knows? I have a question about swarming. Do they always raise drones first? I am due to take off my winter wraps this week and dive in inspection and wondering what exactly to watch for as warnings. Okay, so there has been some YouTube videos about whenever you see the bees raising lots of drones, that means they're going to swarm. That's not always the case. It kind of is something that you usually see during swarming because the only time bees swarm and an actual reproduction swarm, not a, a, a colony absconding from heat or disease or varroa mites and viruses, whatever. But when they actually swarm, bees pick that as a time of the year when there's lots of nutrition coming into the hive. And when there's lots of nutrition, that's when the bees raise drones. However, my best honey production colonies have lots of drones in there too. So drone, seeing a bunch of drones does not always mean that you're going to get swarming, but it does mean the bees are nearing conditions or whatever to be in a position to swarm if they feel like they, they want to. So when you get into that hive, make sure the queen has laying room. She could be pollen bound. She could be nectar bound or getting close to that. We don't want either one of those things. And we want to make sure that she has laying room. That'll prevent it as much as anything. And if, the, if you have some colonies that are a little too far ahead of the others, pull them back. You know, Take a frame of brood out. Make sure you don't take the queen and give it to a good, healthy colony that's a few weeks behind. Equalize the yard out. Retard swarming in the big ones. Help bring up the small ones to honey production size. But don't give it to a colony that's sickly. Just give it to a colony that's got a good brood pattern but a little bit behind. And we do that all the time. I was pulling bees back um, yesterday. And I was able to get into about three colonies this evening um, here at the house um, that I knew had made swarm cells last week. And 
they had just started. They were just queen cups with just a little bit of jelly in them and one or two of them. I went to the entire colony because whenever you see one or two with that jelly in there, you got to go through every frame because it's a lie that they only make swarm cells on the bottoms of the combs. That's where the most of them are, but that's not where all of them are. So you got to go through and make sure you get rid of all of them. And then if they've started it, that means that stimuli is in their system. So you come back like five days later and you check again. Are they trying to raise queen cells again? And so I came back and, and checked and um, only one of them was trying to raise queen cells again. But we also, whenever, when we saw that, we dropped some combs in between, kind of checkerboarded to a degree opened up the brood nest a little bit and made sure the queen had plenty of room to lay. And a lot of times we'll, if they're really strong, we'll, and they often are, we'll pull a frame of um, bees or brood or, or both. And what I mean by pulling bees is a lot, we have those counties that are behind. We will take some frames without the queen, go in for frames that have bee bread or larvae and shake those into another colony. And so we're decreasing the population in that hive and so the bees kind of feel a little pressure relief um you know because when they swarm that's basically you know they're getting rid of bees so we're trying to fulfill that those needs and eliminate that swarming stimuli we gotta get past that and move on to a different stimuli of growth and honey production slash storage all right so Indrit Troni, I wanted to ask another question here. I wanted to know if you treat for nosema before winter. I don't specifically treat for nosema. We don't have really harsh winters here, which make it not as bad, in my opinion. But I do use thymol every year as part of my varroa control, which does help reduce um, some things in the colony. I, I believe it affects nosema to a degree. Um, I've been told that it does. I don't know if that's a fact, but I have not seemed to have any issues with nosema. However, I do have a microscope behind me, and we are going to be checking for that this year, um, and amongst other things with the microscope. And again, thanks to everybody who supplied that. Um, Laurel's looking at a compatible camera right now um, for this thing, so we can, what we see, you can see. And we have a lot of things in the works here. We just, um, you know, with the conference and the YouTube and, and the, the bees. And um, I'm, I'm having to start saying no to a lot of um, clubs and conferences asking me to speak and things. Um, it's very flattering about um, just getting so many requests and so many emails and uh, many companies are wanting uh, to work on different things as well. So trying to balance it all out. I'm trying to learn how to say no and uh, do a better job. So thanks everybody for being so patient with me as I, I learned to manage all these things but there's a lot of exciting things going on too it's part of the reason i was talking to my brother ethan about this um today how you know one of the problems that i have is i love everything that i do so much is a lot of times i, you know, I say yes 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 and i pile on too much and i can't do it all so trying to be a little bit um, better about that okay getting back to some more questions it came, I saw a couple of times you said you tried bee weaver queens and you did not seem happy with the results. Could you give me more details? Um, aggressive, super aggressive bees and, and the ones that I had. A good friend of mine who I know and have known for over a decade um, decided to purchase, it was like 30 or 40 bee weavers and had like 30 plus hives. And he just, he went from having Italians that were very gentle to these and, you know, working in a veil and only in a bee suit on, you know, bad days to not being able to get within 200 yards of the hive sometimes. Um, he's just like, I'd, I'd be, you know, on the other side of the place. And, you know, one of them would zap me. And he's got pictures of his, him and his son with their eyes swollen shut from those things. Not everybody has that experience, but bee weavers um, can be hot. There's two different weaver companies. Um, and, you know, they, they branched off. And, and also they're they're pricey and he didn't find them to be mite resistant and a lot of people who actually do alcohol washes on them find that they're not as mite resistant as advertised but that's my opinion and some people feel differently about them they are totally available to buy
Yeah, where's Laurel video? Um, her video, her public awaits. I it will happen. It, it totally will. I talked to her about that the other day. Yeah, can't um. I'll try not to get too busy for the live chats. We're probably going to start just doing one a month unless, uh, you know, we do an interview with somebody, I would say. Um, but we will continue to do them for sure. And, and you know, occasionally, because we have the time, we might do two. Um, but they, you know, they sometimes can take a good bit of time. But um, we definitely want to communicate through these live chats and take your questions and also let you know what we've got going on. They're a lot more personal than the videos are. And so I really, really like that aspect of them. Um, there was a while we were doing two or three a month and we were doing two or three videos every week. And, and, you know, both kids are in school now and we homeschool and trying to find more time for family. So we're, we're going to, we're shifting everything around. It's all good. It's going to be great. Actually, I think it'll be better once I get it balanced out. Um, do you get revenue from YouTube for the live chat? Well, as you can see above, um, Brian Reese um, donated a hundred dollars, which, you know, Brian, I've got to say is just, um, supported us so much over the years. And I know he does never ask for anything, but, um, you know, he's one of the, the reasons we do these live chats is, um, he's, he's kept it very lucrative for us to do. So I say very lucrative, lucrative to the point that we can, we can do them, but, um, and also has helped me um, a lot, too, because and not all B clubs and meetings are like this. But this is one thing about beekeeping I would really like to change. It's not all about the money, but it kind of is. So that was really profound right there. Right. But we have a certain group of people that feel that and they're entitled to their opinion. That. Because beekeepers are so precious. Um, and, and honeybees are so precious and this, this, and that everybody should just be willing to give freely and speak for nothing or little to nothing and do this and just give, 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 give. That's a really narrow way of looking at it, in my opinion, because first of all, I love honeybees, maybe as much as anybody you've ever met. However, I also love a lot of other things, hunting, fishing. Um, I like caving. I like rock climbing, hiking. I like swimming, snorkeling, scuba diving. I mean, I like all kinds of stuff. And I definitely love playing with my kids and my family. And so at a certain point, you can only give so much. And some of these organizations want you to come speak for like nothing. When you calculate your gas and your food and your time, you could go flip hamburgers, you know? So and I really feel like this has actually impacted the industry negatively. You've got, when you put money into something, it shows that person that you value them, but it also shows the people around you that you value them. And so that's why at our conference, we pay our speakers a, a good bit. And they also do a lot of other perks as well. And we want to let these speakers know that we want them to keep doing it. But I'm, you know, this live chat has helped me with that, though, because a lot of these clubs will say, hey, you know, will, will you come speak for nothing or you know, well, almost as nothing? And I'll be like, well, I can make more money off of a live chat than that. And uh, it kind of helps me get paid a little bit. So that it does help. But I one of the organizations here in Tennessee has had terrible speakers for years and years. And it's just always you go there and it's lethargic and there's nothing new and it's boring. And it just seems like they get the same old speakers all the time. You come to find out some of those guys aren't getting paid anything. They just get their hotel covered for. Well, no wonder you're not getting any cutting edge information or any amazing speakers. Those guys are busy working or researching or doing things. So. As a, as a beekeeping industry, we need to put our money in areas. I'm not saying put them out me, but our money and our time needs to go in areas supporting those who are making the most change, whether it's companies or speakers or whatever. And it's happening. And that's why, you know, we're able to put on the Hive Life Conference and bring out guys like Paul Kelly from the University of Guelph. Um, man, I'm excited for that. Um, we're getting... Bob Benny to come back because can you ever have too much of Bob? I don't think so. 
and he's he's bringing their their storefront to our conference so you'll get to see some of his store front stuff there and maybe he'll have some of his specialty like maybe some sourwood honey that he'll produce this year that would be cool um so you know but money is what brings that all about and we've got a lot of exciting discounts coming this year a lot of creativity so one thing we're thinking about having is like the jester nuke boxes that are pretty pricey to buy in individual quantities what if we grouped by multiple pallets of jester nuke boxes and people could come to the conference and get a, a you know commercial price on jester nuke boxes for the nukes that you sell so there's a lot of cool things that we're going to try to do for the conference this year to help you guys save money and um, again, but it takes money to save money okay my little um soapbox is is done and hey mark thank you so much caught a swarm from one of my three hives been high for 10 days Roaring pretty loud. Have they lost their queen? When should I check for her? Okay. So if this is a primary swarm, typically they'll have that queen in there and she has the capability of laying right away. So it's been high for 10 days. Honestly, um, if it was a laying queen and she's in good shape, then then you need to um, go ahead and get in there. See if you have a laying queen. If, if she was the original queen already laying, she should be going at it by now. If there is no queen in there or there's queen cells, maybe they replaced her. This happens sometimes during swarms. Older queens don't have as good a pheromone production as a younger queen, so they're more prone to swarm. And then a lot of times when they do swarm and then she lays a little bit of eggs, they'll replace her um, partially due to her lack of production. Because when she stops laying during that swarming period, it drops that pheromone production even more and that can cause the supersedure. I've actually seen quite a few swarms. I say quite a few. I'd say 20, 25% of swarms requeen within a month of swarming. And I, th I, th I think that's just kind of common that I, as far as what I know when I've talked to some guys. So just get in there, see what there's, they've got going on. And I don't know why they're being extra loud, but if they're queenless, as you know, a lot of times they will be a little bit loud. Oh, yeah. Bob, Bob Ross is um, one of my favorites to watch um, in art. And Bob Benny is one of my favorites to watch in beekeeping. He's a good guy. And thank you, Mark Foley, again. Brian Reese, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you treat for mites preventative in spring? Yes, you can. It's always this old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Keep those mites low, keep them low, keep them low. And if you do that, your bees will stay strong unless they have a queen issue or nutrition issue or something like that. But um, keep them low. Try to keep them under 1% if you can. Um, definitely no more than 2%. And if, they, if they're at 1.5% or 1%, get ready to treat and, and keep them low. It really helps. Cleaning moldy capped honey. Okay, so if this got a little bit of mold on the outside of the cappings of the honey, um, that's not a huge deal to me. I don't know what your plans are with that mic, but you could uncap that and extract it as long as it's just a little bit of mold on the dry combs that's fine um, it happens sometimes it just blooms there on the wax a little bit it's no problem um, if it's really moldy then maybe um consider giving it back to the bees or something like that as long as it's not like fermented or anything like that all right so um, yeah, so I see your question, um, Indrit Troni, um, why do bees here overwinter in such small clusters? Well, maybe they, maybe they won't, um, if, I don't know what type of bees you have, but like my carnies do overwinter in smaller clusters than Italians. So a good, nice overwintering Italian colony, I could have 10 frames in there of bee coverage going through winter on the strong side. With my carnies, I, I just don't see that very often. I'm not sure I've ever seen that. Um, typically, it seems like seven, maybe eight if they're really good. So 
But if they don't have good nutrition or they have mite pressures or some other problems or the queen's getting old and not laying as much per day, then you'll get even smaller clusters. So a lot of it has to do with the conditions going into winter. Great conditions give you great clusters. So um, I really focus heavily in August and September here to ensure low mite counts. They need a great queen and they need really good nutrition in late August and September and early October here to give me those nice clusters that really come out of winter too strong. And you have to pull those bees back to keep them from swarming. Faithful Acre Farms, thank you so much. And second year of beekeeping, could I do a single brood chamber um, with the eight frame hive? Would the queen have enough space to lay? I'd watch it. It's not that you can't do it, but you got to watch it because that's less space for her to lay. And I really like 10 frames in a 10 frame box. It's not that you can't do it, but what maybe I would do faithful acre farms is plan on coming back in there after you've set it up. And if you have some extra combs, maybe set per hive, two or three drawn combs. And if they seem like they're getting too packed down in there and you see a frame of um, honey or honey and pollen, pull that out. Cause if you're in the middle of the flow, they'll just gather more and you can drop those combs down in there and keep them a little bit of space. I've never run an eight frame through um, a single brood. I have done nine frames in a 10 frame hive and that worked pretty good. So just um, watch it, just keep an eye. And if you have to get in there um, and make sure you keep them from swarming, once they really focus on placing that nectar upward in the honey supers, you're usually pretty good once they've devoted themselves to that. As long as you don't have a massive pollen flow to plug up that brood nest. But uh, keep me posted on that. Never tried it in an eight frame hive. All right. Hey, Pierce Beekeeping. Um, good to hear from you guys. Hope you're making some good equipment over there. And Callie, I uh, really like that USA made stuff. Fixing to use a little bit of it soon. Interesting. How about a couple tables? Interested, interesting, how about a couple tables to raffle off to help support the Hive Life Conference, maybe towards your youth program? Interested, possible, my way to help out thoughts, came in. Absolutely. Um, Andrea Porter, who's a one of our conference supervisors, um, does a silent auction. And this is um, something that we'll, we put up the first day. So I know you make some things to sell, James. So, you know, if you have like some papers that you send with it, we could put it in front of it and of course, we'd be very thankful to have anything for the silent auction. 100% of that goes to the kid program. And of course, that could be some advertising for what you do as well, if, if you would wish. But uh, we will have a silent auction. Last year was pretty massive. I think it was probably about, I don't know, 70 feet of tables, 60 feet of tables. I don't know. It was quite a, quite a bit of tables. And it generated over $6,000 towards the kid program. Plus, we've had other things in addition to that. So right now, um, I think we're up at $9,000 towards kids. And I'm hoping that we'll be like somewhere, um, at least in the twenties. And this, of course, that's a lot of money, but like, where's that going? So it's going into their food for the conference. Um, any other expenses for the conference, they won't have any of those things. Um, if they have a guardian, it'll cover them as well for the conference food. Um, all, you know, getting the, the bag for both of them at the beginning of it. Um, also, it's going to cover their hotel. Um, we're going to be looking through that. And I uh, just talked to our web guy recently, and we are working on having the conference 100% made available for tickets and vendors to sign up by June so we can really focus on, on getting that done. I think it's going to be pretty darn massive. And we're going to have Thursday for you guys this year, too. I'm really excited about Thursday because um, that little bit of extra time will give us more time to get pictures taken. I, I, I wanted some pictures um, last year, um, this last conference, and I didn't get a chance to get them with some of the guys. And um, this will this will be um, a, a time just for networking and fun. But yeah, James, if you if you want to do something like that, totally. Yeah, LaGrange bees. Um, my wife feels um, that way quite a bit too, being an introvert as well. Um, I, I don't understand it. Laurel and I have had this conversation. It's just interesting how uh, different people um, can be. I 
I was raised around um, a lot of people um, in church, and my dad got me up doing um, song leading. And then by the time I was a teenager, uh, I was doing a couple sermons. So um, I was also part of our bluegrass band, and because I was the loudest um, and willing to do it, I became the MC of the bluegrass band. We did a lot of bluegrass back in the day. And between that and then, um, I've just always been a, a people person. Um, my grandpa um, was like that, and he hung around us a lot and was quite the jokester. So my humor a lot of times comes from him, by the way, and I wish you all could have met him. He was a huge supporter of everything that I did, even back when I was doing everything wrong, and uh, he, was, he was just fun. He was, he was great grandpa. Let you do all the stuff. Um, nothing, nothing dangerous, but you know, getting to drive when you're 14, what's that going to hurt? Just don't tell your mom. <laughs> ah, yeah, I haven't watched any of the bizarre films. Um, I don't, I just don't have that kind of time to waste, I suppose. I've actually, someone commented about that in the group and they said, oh, I love watching the bizarre. It's, it's funny. And I haven't watched it, so maybe I'm wrong, but to me, it really reeks of a bad image for beekeepers. We have so many good people. Of course, reality TV can never have somebody like, you know, Bob Benny or, you know, someone who's an awesome beekeeper who would represent beekeeping in a positive way and encourage people to get in the right way. It always has to be some product or somebody who seems to it's, I don't, I don't know. I say it's moving on. Do you have issues with bears in Tennessee? Yes, in parts of East Tennessee, especially. I have never had issues with them, but towards the Smokies, you definitely get issues with bears. Yeah, I definitely haven't watched any bizarre episodes, Todd. Uh, I have friends that aren't beekeepers that have known me for longer than. I've had my YouTube channel. They're like, see, Cayman, you missed an opportunity here. You could have done something like that, and uh, you'd be making a lot more money. Sometimes the money is just not worth it. Well, uh, thank you, Indrit um, Troni. I hope I'm getting your name right. I'm probably not, but thanks for coming on. I do appreciate you. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun getting to talk to beekeepers. Um, one of my favorite things. I don't know how many hours I spent of my life talking to beekeepers, but it's a lot. Cayman, how long does it usually take a queenless hive to start having a laying worker? Well, um, when the colony goes queenless, they, they typically won't start going laying worker until they run out of brood pheromones. It's actually um, having healthy good brood and, and some of the pheromones of the queen probably too but when they run out of brood that's really when it triggers um, the most so if you see a queenless colony that has brood and they, they're not in the laying worker stage something you could do to prevent that is to add some eggs and stuff in there while your queen is coming in but honestly um, young splits um, young bees except queens the best so just you know as far as all that goes i don't know what the timing is three days five days a week ten days that'd be something somebody who's you know done some research on that would have to tell you i don't know a specific timeline if anyone finds out though tell me it's it's an interesting question one i haven't really stopped to think about Do you have a dad joke beekeeping or otherwise? I have a lot of dad jokes, but um, my poor kids, I don't usually have them prepared. They just happen. Oh, that's, 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 that's pretty bad. That's a bad joke right there. Do you checkerboard your honey supers, top super or bottom super? I don't checkerboard my honey supers. And if I do any checkerboarding, it's always going to be in the brood nest. Now, if you're talking about are you checkerboarding with foundation, I guess if you call it checkerboarding, um, I do put foundations in my honey supers. And that way I can get a couple of new drawn combs. 
and that's it's really a, a nice way to you know if you have two in each one and you put four mediums on a colony, then you're going to get eight if they're all drawn out. And if you do that over 100 colonies, you know, that's 800 combs. And if you put nine to a box, which I usually do next year, that's going to be the equivalent of not quite 100 supers. So, you know, that's a, or, you know, so that, that's a good bit right there. And bees, bees want to draw some comb. You, you need to get some new comb drawn every year if you can. It doesn't have to be a bunch. But I think when the bees decide to draw comb, it also helps retard the swarming tendency to a degree as well. Hey, Zach Heinzelman, how are the queens going in Hawaii? We were talking about Hawaii earlier, but we weren't talking about you. We're talking about um, David's Kiave honey. People, someone asked me about some of my favorite types of honey. Hey, Vanderpool Farms. Got some of the commercial guys in here tonight. All right. Nice. Gus, Gus, good to, good to hear from you. Black locust and blackberry are putting out a lot of nectar. Whoo! So you got black locust down there. Good. I was wondering if it just decided not to bloom this year. It's so much later than usual. But now the blackberries are really budding. They haven't opened up any buds, but it looks like a there might be a good bloom set. So I'm really hoping for that. And this is something that I, you know, doing a lot of gardening over the years, and you know, just, I love gardening, is some plants actually respond to trauma in a positive way as far as in reproduction as long as like crazy trauma but we have had a lot of windy stormy weather this year and it's broken off a lot of even green growth on some trees not like all of it but some of it and there are some plants in the garden that you actually can go through and kind of beat them up a little bit and that'll kick them into the gear of okay we're taking damage we really need to put forth some energy into um, fruit set or seed set, you know, which you know, reproduction. So for nectar producing plants, I'm hoping that all this rough weather is theoretically going to encourage more blooming. There's a lot to do with the, the types of nitrogen in the soil as well. That causes some night, you know, some nitrogens produce more blooms versus some that actually encourage more leaf growth. So a lot of weather patterns and rainfall can really impact how plants bloom from year to year. Cayman, do you run a top entrance when you have three or four supers on? Um, I don't. Um, I, I've thought about it and maybe I should, but I, I typically don't. Um, some, sometimes there'll be so many gaps um, in between some of the older boxes that they have ventilation anyways. But I definitely have the entrances wide open right now. Is Caveman your favorite nickname? You know, I've never had a nickname that has stuck really good. I've had um, the only one I could say that has really survived the test of time. I don't get called this very much, um, but my uncle will call this to me um, every blue moons is Cam Bam. Because of those of you who watch the Flintstones, um, you had Bam Bam. And I was so destructive, apparently, and moved so much stuff around with my body and uh, hit so many um, things with my head that um, Cam Bam became the nickname. So, but it didn't stick around very long. I don't know. You know, when you have a name like Cayman, do you need a nickname? But Caveman, I've gotten called that maybe as much as anything. Honestly, most of pe most people don't call me by my name anyways. They can't pronounce it right. I get Cameron more often, it seems like, than I do Cayman. And uh, Camden, get that one periodically. I've been called Karen before. I hope I'm not a Karen. <laughs> Uh, I apologize to all the Karens out there. Do you have to rotate the brood box or will the queen move down to the bottom box? So the queens sometimes will move down to the bottom boxes, um, but sometimes they won't. I do rotate brood chambers from time to time, but it's not something I just, you know, this is something we do to every colony. I, I take it on a per case basis. And some queens are really good about going down there and laying it up or they start down there and lay it up really good and they move their way up. And then there's some colonies that kind of uh, get stuck up in the top a little bit. And it's really weird. Sometimes I just um, rotate some things around, but you have to watch the weather. If you do a full rotation and you're expecting seventies and eighties for the next several days or week, you know, that's great. But if you do a rotation, you got eight frames of bees in the top and nothing in the bottom and you rotate that, 
and you're getting highs and you know 39 degrees Fahrenheit, 40 degrees, then that can really limit the colony and sometimes even set them back in extreme cold because that their, that heat loss is going up and through that deep above and then they're, they're just not recapturing much of it where if they're up against the lid they can recycle some of that heat a little bit better and especially in those early spring days especially for you northern beekeepers that are still just warming up the more the bees are able to the more easily it is for them to keep that cluster warm the more they can expand quicker and so this is sometimes why insulation can be helpful um, as you can have a little bit of insulation in there and help that out. But ultimately, the big colonies seem to do just fine. It's, it's usually the ones that are a little bit behind that seem to need the most help. But I don't rotate as something that is just a, it is a tool in the toolbox, kind of like a queen excluder. I love queen excluders, but used incorrectly, they can cause swarming. So for those of you who don't know, if you are starting out with new bees and all you have is foundation, and excluder is a bad idea until they start drawing combs in the next box. So let's say you want you have two deeps that the bees are working on. They're drawing out the combs in there and everything. That's great. But now you're wanting mediums for honey supers. Well, don't put an excluder on and then put a box of foundation. That will that will prevent them from work getting up there and working as quickly. Just put on the foundation, and this is the same way with any foundation just put on the foundation and then once they have started to draw it about 25 to 30 percent of the way make sure the queen's not up there and you can just shake every frame that has beads on it down below into the brood nests and then put that excluder on and then they'll pass through it um, very easily because they have comb up there they have resources up there and they have a desire but foundation they look at that and go what the heck is this and so the excluder just um, kind of can slow them down even more of going up in that area of whatever that stuff is. But once they turn it into comb, they pass through excluders very, very good. So using an excluder with combs works very good. But I see a lot of people that complain about excluders when they use foundation. I came and I wanted to give you an update on the Russian hybrid. It's the only queen that's Russian, but they both are laying end to end on the frame. So they are Russian hybrid bees. Will be a plenty. So, all right, Jim Cooley, thanks for the update. Um, you know, those, you know they, those, those, those bees are rushing around. <laughs> oh, gosh. There's the dad joke for you. I remember my grandpa saying that one time when I was mentioning the genetics to him. All right, so we got Ricky with horizontal bees. Good deal. I actually have got to get in that horizontal hive. I'm going to really try to keep them from swarming. That colony is massive. I've already pulled two great frames of capped brood from them and two the adhering bees and two shakes of bees out of there. So I've already made a really nice nukes worth of a pullback from that colony trying to keep them from swarming. And I, I want them to get to their peak right at the start of the flow, which is just beginning here. And... Um, Hoping to hope, hoping to pack that horizontal out with bunches of honey this year. I would I would really like to produce. Oh, I'd love to produce 130 pounds out of it, but I'd like to produce over 100 pounds out of it this year. What do you do about last year's syrup that is not used up by the bees over the winter and sits in the frames as crystallized syrup? Bees do not use and just seem to take up space. So, hmm, I have never run into a lot of that. Hmm. I don't know. Does anyone have any tips on that? Uh, you know, of course, I have had a little bit of feed crystallized in the combs, but not much. Any of you guys got any experience on here with uh, crystallization, like a lot of it? Like I had a dead out today that I figured was coming, but I kind of just ignored it and let it see if it would work out or not, and, and it did not. And I got in there, there's three frames of syrup, and they weren't crystallized, though, and I was able to just give them to a small split that needed a little bit of food, and that worked out just fine. Maybe give them to a small split or something you do and see if they'll use it. I don't know. You're up, you're up there in Alaska, Bullwinkle, though, and so, you know, crystallized feed can be really bad, in, as you know, in areas like that. So I don't know. 
maybe dilute it down with some water or something. So, yeah, I got to apologize and say, uh, you know, today's video was a little bit of a stinker. <laughs> uh, the jokes. Uh, it, I thought for sure I'd get it to work. I even tried crumbling it up. I deleted a lot of the footage out of it, and I still couldn't get it to light. It was very dry. Um, I was told by some people that I need to start off with, like, straw or hay or wood chips and work my way up to it. But I just felt like that defeated the purpose, you know, for using manure as, like, kind of a, a last resort, because why would it be your first resort? <laughs> um then why not just use more hay or wood chips? Maybe if you're in a bind or something, you see a, a dry paddy out in the field. I don't know. So obviously there are people that know uh, some more about it than I do, but it didn't work good for me. And it took a lot of time. It just seems like a, it'd be just something that would be a last resort. All right, looking forward to a, a hopefully a good black locust bloom. I can't believe it's blooming around the time of the blackberry blossoms, though. It seems like it's, it's delayed a good bit. And if I'm seeing just a start of tulip poplar. So if we get black locust, tulip poplar, and blackberry to perform good all at the same time, we could be having a really, really good flow, and that, which is kind of a double-edged sword because on our honey production colonies, that can be great. But all of our splits and our queen rearing colonies, that can mean backfilling and plugging out and be an issue. So watch that. That's the thing. Some years you got to feed your splits more than others. So when it comes to feeding those new packages or those new splits that you make, get in there once a week, see what's going on. If they are capping a bunch of food off and have a bunch of weight, then maybe hold back a little bit. You don't want to see a lot of sugar syrup. And a lot depends on what you have. If you only have foundations for them, you have to be a, a lot more careful. When you have a lot of combs, um, then you can just give them more combs as they're getting a little full here but i can plug in a couple combs here and there or just add a whole box of combs above and the bees will use that and just move the nectar or sugar syrup up and it's a whole lot easier but you know if they're a little reluctant to draw that foundation out for even just a handful of days and they get a strong flow for a few days and plug that brood nest out guess who's getting swarm cells comb is awesome if i said that before Southern Florida. Good morning from Germany. Oh, good morning in Germany. Thanks for coming on. Ah, good flow down in Memphis area. Woohoo. Well, good luck to you guys on a good honey flow this year. My plan is to come out and visit you um, sometime, Gus, and do uh, help you out and also and do a, some collaboration videos. We've been talking about that for over a year, and we need to make it happen this year. Jim Cooley, are you still using your Apame hives? Totally. Um, am, and uh, they work really good. Uh, I definitely think that you know, bees do fine in them. The plastic doesn't hurt them or anything, but they are more expensive, but they definitely work just fine. I was checking, uh, I think I went through a dozen yesterday, and... Thank goodness for some help coming in the near future. I think the first bit of help will be here in about 10 days or so uh, for the experimental yard. We're not getting as many videos out lately, partially due to the, the time we're already spending on the conference. We're spending a lot of time. I spent, um, we spent two full days last week on the conference. Two full days, um, so even during this time of the year. So, that's just telling you how much time it's taking um, from us. And it's good, though. Um, and the work has to be done. So Vanderpool Farms has some information about um, crystallized honey bullwinkle. Maybe, um, maybe help out a little bit. You definitely would like them to burn it up before winter. So do you like them, Jim Cooley, working out pretty good for you? Bruce's bees. All right. There you are, Bruce. I talked to you just on the, the other day on the phone. Hope you're still doing good down there. Hope the flow's doing good in Alabama. 
What's the best way to store drawn frames? The best way to store them is without any bee bread in them and is without any resources, no no dead bees in them or net, no, no dead brood in them. So nothing besides the combs themselves. Um, you can use paramoth crystals if you want to, but we store ours with plenty of ventilation. Um, well, I mean, ideally, it'd be nice if you could store them in like a cold room, but who has that kind of money? Oh, Bob, Bob's got that kind of money. Some commercial guys do that, but we just store ours in my shed. I got two sheds actually that they're in. There's no, nothing special about them except that in a 10 frame hive, a lot of times we'll we'll just put eight frames in there and then we will make sure there's plenty of ventilation. We protect them from mice because they'll build nests in them. So hardware cloth below and above, keep it off the ground a little bit so that you can get a little bit of light and air circulation and definitely have it to where it can get light above on the top. And that works good for us. You know, we'll get a couple tunnels in there periodically, but nothing that the bees can't fix. And that seems to work really, really good for us. Now, you can, the Paramoth crystals will work really good too, if you want to be sure. You, you got to seal the boxes up and put those on and that'll kill any wax moss that get in there or lay eggs in there. You're welcome, Stephen Allen. I hope it was good. Yeah. Yeah, your flow's just starting down there in Alabama. Wow, that's crazy. But, you know, to me, you know, those of us who have those summer dirts like we have in Tennessee and Alabama, especially in the majority of the state, it's a little different from location to location. But I like it when these years are a little bit behind. Not that we, you know, have late frost or anything. That's I don't want anything that damages the bloom, but when it's behind, typically we get less chance for a late frost. And so we, we, it seems like we've skirted past any late frost, which is exciting. So a lot of times we'll lose black locust to that. And occasionally, if it's real late, tulip poplar. And those are both big losses on uh, nectar. And also, this is the biggest reason, if it backs up the flow another 10 days, 14 days, that means 10 to 14 days, typically less of dearth for my bees. And I like that. So, you know, of course, earlier in the season, I get a little bit more winter, but I can just feed them a little bit of sugar syrup and some pollen patties between the pollen flows to keep them stimulated. And that seems to work pretty good. Smitty's Chainsaws and Firewood. Well, thanks for coming on, and thank you so much for the donation. I'm not a beekeeper. Hey, but I love the channel. My dad kept bees, and it really brings back memories. Thanks for the great content. Well, wow, I really do appreciate that, and um, your dad was a beekeeper. Well, maybe one of these days he'll be one, too, and if you ever um, do, make sure you hop on and ask some questions, and you're still welcome to ask questions, of course, but that's really nice of you to come on to our channel, even though you're not keeping bees actively, but um, we'll convert you, you know, there's, when you're done with all the chainsaw and firewood, um, maybe you can take like a chainsaw and cut out like a, a hive out of a log or something like that. That'd be, that'd be kind of cool. Make like a, a log top bar hive, not top bar, a horizontal hive. I mean, you could do a top bar too, but they're just, to me, it's a lot more work. I like frames. Love them. Great invention. Ah, uh, yes. I didn't think about this. This shirt does kind of go good with the American flag in the back. You know, I've got a lot of USA stuff. I'm just kind of partial like that. You know, and this is something I thought of earlier. Um, I, I was like, what sh my hair was a little bit of a mess. Um, and so uh, I just threw this cap on. And I thought, well, if Randy McCaffrey comes on the Dirt Rooster tonight, then I'm just going to say, hey, Randy, I'd I was a lighting a smoker with some manure today, and it made me think of you, and so I had to go put my dirt rooster hat on. <laughs> Randy's a great guy. Dandelions just came out today. And see, that's interesting. Um, I think you guys have different dandelions up north than we do. There's different strains of them. I never see any significant thing from dandelions in Tennessee. 
in my area. However, when our dandelions bloom, they're like the small ones in the yards and you, in the yard, and you will see a couple bees on them from time to time. But during that time, we have dead nettle, henbit. We'll have um, a lot of times we'll have some snow flowers going as well. And there's also um, chick something another type flower chickpea. No, not chickpea. Yeah, something like that. It's not henbit. But it's a little blue flower, and they'll get a little white pollen from it. And it just seems like they ignore the dandelion around here, by and large, because there's so many other good options. And of course, we we get the um, some of the hardwood wood trees. I think also, yeah, I think the bass, not the basswood, the box elder is blooming, and it drives me nuts with allergy problems. But the bees really go after that stuff. So the dandelion isn't really a huge deal, at least to me here in Tennessee. And from what I understand, it's really not that great of a pollen by itself. It needs other pollens to complement with it. But uh, I just find that fascinating because to some people, I hear that you make dandelion honey up north off of some of that stuff. That just blows my mind. We're not getting dandelion honey down here. Yeah, Gus. Gus and I have been buddies for like, uh, well, we've known of each other at least for like 14, 13, 14 years. And I said we've been buddies most of that time. Um, early on, it was just kind of beekeepers chatting and ended up turning into a, um, a lot of collaborating over the years on buys and um, experiences and definitely been um, very beneficial on my end. Um, but yeah, the only problem about Gus, though, the thing that drives me most nuts about Gus is he makes me look like that big. <laughs> He's a lot taller than I am, but it's it's all good. I'm used to it. It's like Randy McCaffrey does me that way too. It's like all my buddies are huge. I mean, why why can't I get any like cool guys that are like you know five five and make me feel a little tall? It's all good. Yeah, I I actually was thinking about Ian today. It's just. It just seems like the, the Canadians are already down and it just feels like the weather's kicking them while they're down. It's, it's just really rough. And I, I hope that this will just clear up. And, you know, last year was drought and this year there's just so much water in the form of snow and everything else. I'm hoping that it'll just smooth out, dry up and get their canola. And then because of the, the moisture and, and the ground, it'll, it'll do a really good job for them. That's what kind of what my hope is. So central Wisconsin and just getting some red maple to start to bud out here in central Wisconsin about 30 days later than last year. Wow, 30 days later. See, we were pretty late um, this year. It didn't, ours didn't start blooming and producing pollen until almost March. And a lot of, some of it was running into March. I've had really warm years where I've had it produce pollen the last week of January. So I think that's a good lesson, though, for the, those of you who are new beekeepers. Expect the unexpected when it comes to beekeeping and keep notes. You don't think it's that big of a deal, but keeping these notes is able to let me keep track of this was blooming this year. And I, I love to keep track of everything. And you find that this year, these two plants overlapped on their bloom. But then a year or two later, that plant that was blooming with Black locust is now blooming with blackberry blossom. You know, it, 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 it's interesting. And you'll learn stuff. 5'7". Oh, just, just a little too tall to make the Cayman Reynolds short club. Sorry, we don't allow anybody over 5'6 to, to make the cut. Sorry about that. All jokes aside. Hmm. A business question. Sorry, do you ship queens? No, no problem, Scott. That's what we're here for. We actually, this is the first year in several years we're not going to sell any queens. I'm just going to raise my own and that's it. Um, the conference and the, I didn't do a near of a good of a job on getting videos on many things last year that I said that I would. And I've got to focus on that and the research. And so the queens, we're going to, the nukes is more profitable. And the Queens is just something that we're not going to do um, this year. So that is a, a bummer. And I hate that. 
Um, but I don't see us starting to raise queens to sell. Unless we hire some employees, I don't see us having any queens for sale in the near future, except in what would be in our nukes. Hey, Cayman, you think the bees might move the storage feed up to the supers when our, they are added to make room for the queen to lay? It is possible, but unless there's a lot of it, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Right now, they're burning through so much food as they are raising all this brood. You know, I want to feed up right to where I'm putting the honey supers on, but typically, I mean, why, why, if they have a nectar flow coming in, I, I guess if, if they could clear some room for the queen, if you had like three or four syrup frames up top and they're not on the edge or even if they are and they need to clear some of that room for the queen. But a lot of times as they're clearing, they try to burn it up and just use it if they need it for something else. But it could happen. Maybe go in there right as you add your honey supers. And if they don't need that food, just if you have some extra combs or a foundation or two, put it on the, like if you got the edge frames here, you can put it inside those, some, some foundations. And as they expand that brood nest, they can draw those out. Or if you have combs, put those in there and just take those out and give them to a split or put them in the freezer if you're worried about that and give the queen some more room to lay. But it's possible. I've never really seen a good instance of that happening in my bees, though. I know Rachel's 411, Brian Reese, you know, that's why your wife, uh, you know, I, I think I complimented her um, when we met. I was like, you know, Rachel, I really appreciate you. You, you make me feel really tall um it's it's all good I, I tease about it a lot my cousin was picking on me today about you know being so short so what it doesn't really matter i i got married to laurel that's really the only accomplishment i needed to make in life is to marry well and i did that so you know so what i've got tall friends who are still single <laughs> Uh, if, if you're one of those tall friends watching this video, um, sorry, guys, I just couldn't help it. it. Tease me all the time. All right, getting back to some questions. Cayman, have you ever notched comb under larvae to make queen cells? And how does it work? I've heard about that. I know enough, just enough to be dangerous, Frank Spees. I don't know much about that. Don't know much at all. One thing I do know that was an old technique used back, I think I saw the um, diagram done in about 130 years ago. It was right before the turn of the century, 1890. I cannot remember the name of the guy that did it. I think, no, it wasn't in GM Doolittle's book, or maybe it was. I need to reread that book. Anyways, what they did is they took some you know, foundationless frame, or you can use a starter strip. And you can get the bees to draw it out part way. And then you place that into right in the middle of the brood nest. And you get the queen to lay eggs in that. But you have to monitor it. And then in the colony that you want to raise queens from, like a queenless colony, instead of grafting queens into that, you can put that frame that's only part of the way drawn out, has eggs in it. And then they will draw those into queens and you can cut those out. It's, it's pretty labor intensive, if you ask me, but it does work. So there's many ways to raise queens. I don't know much about notching those cells, but there is um, different ways to do it besides grafting for sure. Beekeeping with Natalie. Oh, oh sorry, I'm late. I was spending my time doing more important things than listening to Cayman. That's a pretty long list, Natalie, but you know, we're glad that you did decide and you did run out of more important things to do than to come on here and listen to me. Um, our phone conversation not too long ago was actually really good. Uh, I thought what you said um, about how much you have um, respect me and all those things, it, it was really meaningful and I appreciated the compliment, Allie. I, I really did. You've had some good videos, Natalie. I really thought you've had um, some really enjoyable videos and uh, so definitely getting some good views and sounds like you you and your dad have been making a ton of splits. Was it like 50 splits or something like that? Or was it more than that? I, I cannot remember how many splits it was. 
looking forward to seeing the video on that if uh, you haven't already released it. Hey, Cayman, I raised a queen in a hive about three weeks ago, and still, and she still hasn't made her mating flight. Will she be okay if she does in the next week, or has she went too long? Yeah, queens actually, over a period of time, will just never fly out of the hive, even if they never went on a mating flight. I raised a queen in a hive about three weeks ago. So was she emerged from the cell three weeks ago, or was it a queen cell three weeks ago? That's kind of what I need to know at this point, Isaac, right? But if she's been in the hive for three weeks, emerged and has not made it at this point and is still not laying good, then yeah, something's wrong and that needs to be addressed and fixed. But if it was a queen cell, it's still a pretty good bit of time. But, you know, come back in a couple of days and if she's not laying, I'd, I'd say... Um, form a coup and combine it back with another colony and make a split with another queen later or something else. Those things happen. Um, maybe something's wrong with their abdomen. I have occasionally seen some um, abdomens of queens that were damaged in, during development for whatever reason. Maybe I accidentally bumped it or, or who knows why. Maybe that she didn't get quite the nutrition, was positioned weird. I don't know. Um, I've also had some, maybe she has a little bit of a bent wing or something, wasn't able to fly good. Maybe she didn't get mated properly. I don't know, but those things do happen. Hmm. Ah, Miller. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right, Gus. It was Miller. See, Gus is my bee book buddy. Well, I, I can talk bee books, and he's the only guy I know that reads more bee books than I do. I'm sure there are other guys out there, but most people don't. And, uh, yeah, Gus reads a lot of bee books. Yeah, beekeeping with Natalie, she's, you know, one of those young kids that, um, you know, just doesn't, hasn't, doesn't, it's, you know, it's not a thing. It didn't used to be this way, but kids nowadays, just no respect. No respect of mature adults like myself. My grandpa would say, well, Cayman, maybe if you act your age and not your shoe size. Yeah, that would probably help a little bit. Yeah, Gus Mitchell um, is about to hit the thousands uh, subscriber mark. I, I figure it'll be around the end of the month, and um, I think... Gus, are you doing a giveaway for, the, for a hitting a thousand on your YouTube channel? If you guys haven't, check out Gus Mitchell's channel. Um, he's got some really good content. Keeps a few hundred hives of bees. Does a lot of comb honey and just getting into um, a lot of YouTube video content and does a lot of stuff that a lot of us guys don't do. So um, I, I watch most of his videos and I you know I, I know a lot of the information because I talk to him on the phone, but you know, whatever. I've got an in. You got to know people. So Brad with Faith Apiaries has a good video on YouTube about notching the comb. Okay, well, Brad's another friend. And Brad Hogg um, with Faith Apiaries. Um, now, um, he's He's got some YouTube videos. I haven't seen that particular one, but I have seen other good videos that he's done. So maybe I'll check that out if you're wanting to See about notching cells. Be careful with Natalie. We all know that I never said that. I'm pretty sure I remember hearing that. Something about, you know, just amazing mentor, something like that. Grateful. Those are the words that kind of stick out. Cayman, why do the bees ball the queen? I didn't see any new or old queen cells. I was checking the hive and seeing them finish her off. Okay, there's multiple times when the bees will ball the queen. Sometimes you just come into a colony and the, the queen was on her way out. Um, this happens occasionally. It doesn't happen often, but when a queen doesn't have the laying capacity that she should, or maybe she does lay good, but her pheromone production isn't good. Either one of those reasons can get her canned and they will tear a queen from limb to limb. 
um, when they do this. And that could be one instance. Another instance is when the hive is going through a requeening procedure. So if, if you have a cell that you put in there, or maybe you didn't put one in there, but they were going through a supersedure period. So maybe they off the queen and then a virgin queen is running around the colonies. Virgin queens are kind of sensitive. It's really good to fool with virgins, in my opinion, as little as possible. And I think that can go a long way as far as in human life and beekeeping. But don't read too much into that. Virgin queens, when you open up a hive, like if you have a mating nuke and you put a queen cell in there and you're really eager to, oh, let's see if there's a queen in there. Does she want to actually come out of the cell, you know? But she's in the virgin stage and you puff smoke in there, even just beat around the hive a little bit, just open up the lid. They'll ball and kill the virgin queen. So there's a, a lot of different instances, but sometimes you just go in and you don't you didn't realize what was happening and it causes them to ball the queen. Sometimes there's two queens in there. And I've seen this happen before. You'll have a mated queen going around and laying. And a virgin queen will come from a, somewhere else and she'll go into the wrong hive and they'll kill her sometimes they won't kill her and she'll go right into the hive kill your queen sometimes and then she hopefully she'll get mated and take over the colony africanized bees um, send out little swarms i have seen swarms take over a colony before it's very rare at least in my experience but I think Africanized bees are more known for this, and they'll send off a bunch of small swarms going to European colonies, European honeybee colonies, and they will kill the queen and supersede her and then take over, and you, what was a gentle hive becomes a hot one. There's a lot of dynamics we don't fully understand with this, and I would love to see a good presentation on a lot of this information. You know, I, I just kind of give you the basics, but it definitely is. Um, there's a lot of reasons a queen can get bald. I don't like it when I see it, though. I know for certain um, that when, but whenever a queen is in the virgin stage, whenever you know you're doing walk away splits or any splits and there's queen cells in there, do not get into the hive until that queen has time to come back and is laying. Or you very well may kill your queen or the, cause the bees to kill the queen. Yeah, Gus did a great job with Bruce's um, channel and the guys the other night. I watched probably about an hour and a half of that and um, while I was working on some of the conference stuff. So that was, that was fun. It's really nice to see so many good beekeepers chatting. It's awesome. Hmm. When wax dipping double screen board, should you dip before or after adding the screens? Um, I've done it with the screens. I didn't see it as a big problem, but when they come out of the tank, you want to immediately shake them really hard. Um, just do that like whip-like motion like you're shaking bees off of a frame and get that wax off of the, um, the screen. Now I use number eight hardware cloth on mine, so it comes off pretty good. I do, sometimes you do get a little bit of it still on the screen, but that's really not a big, big deal. And if you needed to get it off, you could use a heat gun or something like that, or a little blowtorch and do that. But a little bit on the screen isn't a big deal to me. And, uh, but you could do it afterwards too, because it's going to be inside the colony. It depends on how big of a hole you're making. You know, mine, my holes are in the uh, double screen boards are just one that big and right in the center. Some people put two or three. Um, of course, Man Lake ones are like the entire thing. I mean, it's like the rim with the screen. I don't like that. It's too too lightweight, in my opinion. Heat rises. It wants to rise. And so it. I feel like that one hole in the center is plenty enough to get that heat to go through there. And the, the double screen boards that I have, I bet 100 made like that. They seem to work very, very good. I probably... I probably still got about 10 in, in use right now. Most of them um, are now getting dropped onto singles as their own. Does activity around a swarm trap mean there's a swarm in the area or can they be scout bees? The hive is not swarmed yet. It could be so um, that they're checking it out. They 
if you go and, and read Tom Seeley's book, The Honeybee Democracy, then you will see that they, you know, they send a bunch of scouts out and yeah, we'll check it out. So I was going and looking at a empty dead out box in one of my bee yards and there were bees that looked like they were scouting out. There was no resources in there, like honey or anything like that. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I come back next time to that yard and there's a swarm moved into that box. It happened to me last year two times. Yeah, two times into dead out equipment, the bees just moved in. So probably scouting it out, and hopefully you'll come back and find some some bees in there. Yeah, so you said sometimes there's 50 bees and sometimes two or three using Swarm Commander. That's a pretty good sign, uh, sign Clint and Christina. I hope that works out for you. Should I feed pollen patties to a newly installed package in addition to syrup? It depends on what's going on, Adam. So I just got six packages for um, the experimental yard for some of the losses. And um, so I had a couple of people actually ask why we did that instead of using our own bees. Well, when you get a grant they um, for some of these things, they won't let you use your own bees. You have to purchase them from another company instead of purchasing your better bees. But, you know, it is grant, so, you know, I can't argue with that. And they just want to make sure that, you know, it's actually getting done, so they want to see receipts and all that jazz. Anyways, those six packages, I haven't given them any pollen patties because we have had a really nice spring where there's been plenty of days for them to get out, and we have really good pollens in April here in Tennessee. So it depends on where you're at. A little bit definitely won't hurt. And especially look at that weather forecast. I install my packages and we're going to get five, seven, some poor days, rainy days, cold days. They can't fly. And with packages, the first bit of bees, you want to get as many as you can that first round. So you want to make sure they have plenty of syrup and plenty of protein because all those bees are getting older by the day. And pretty soon they're going to be gone. So you need to get as much out of you. As, as you can out of those packaged bees. So a little pollen patty won't hurt. And I have done that. It, a lot of it depends on the weather. If they're able to fly out very often and you have a lot of pollen, then maybe don't worry about it. But if you want a little insurance, maybe throw a quarter pound in there and, and give it to each colony. And if they consume it good and you feel like it's helping, give them a little bit more. But um, it's a tool and it needs to be used appropriately. And sometimes you can waste feed, um, giving it to them when they don't really need it. So Kent Vernon says, I've watched Bob's video on cell building a few times. Do you have any advice on when to start that in the season? I'm up here in Alberta, Canada. So this, I think, generally applies with queen rearing anywhere, is you don't want to rush the season. I know in Canada you have a shorter season, so you, you need to get it done while the uh, getting's good. However, it takes time, it takes bees energy, and it takes, you know, a lot of energy all the way around to make queens. So I don't like to push the season. You can start, the, the general rule of thumb is you can start raising queens when you have drones that are capped in the purple-eyed stage. I prefer to wait until they're, it's a little bit further along than that. Whenever your bees are about the time period that, to think about swarming is when I usually start raising queens. I'll raise them a little bit earlier than that if I'm selling a bunch. But uh, I'm not in any big rush. Um, if sometimes the difference between good queen, great queen rearing timing and a bad take on my queens coming back is just a week. Look at the weather forecast, see what it's going to be like. But um, I usually wait until you know, I have some drones and wait till there's a good bee population out there. But um, I just don't like to push the season too far. But yeah, I mean, just make sure there's... The, basically, when when the bees are in the around the time of swarming, that's when they're really good at raising queens, and that's kind of just makes sense. Thanks for coming on, John, up there in Vermont. Hope you got you're doing good and have a good night and all that. What factors make the best queens? Is it drone population and drone source colonies? Strong cell builders? Strong 
breeder queen. So it is a combination of several things. First of all, you can have a queen that's given all the good nutrition, comes from great stock, but if she doesn't get mated well um, by multiple um, drones and lots of diversity, then she, she'll never be a great queen. Bees thrive on diversity. So there's got to be some of that. But it really starts with nutrition. Well, maybe it starts with genetics. And genetics are important, but as far as you all who have a small operation or a hobby operation, don't concern yourself with getting too crazy about the genetics. I mean, go to your colonies that survive and are thriving and are gentle, don't have any issues, and graft from those. Don't graft from the losers. That's pretty basic right there. But honestly, wouldn't you like all of your colonies to have the same characteristics or similar characteristics of your champion hives? So don't overcomplicate it um, when you're first getting into it. Just raising quality queens off of those will still be really good. So that, that's the genetics. Then go from there to nutrition. The best queens are raised in swarm-like conditions. Don't let them, the colony swarm. But when bees are swarming, they raise good, strong, well, well-fed queens. And so we try to mimic that with our queen-rearing colonies. We want really packed colonies to raise queens. We want an abundance of nutrition. And between that and the good genetics, that's going to give us some good queens. But then we've got to have good drone population. And then we just hope the weather cooperates. But all those factors together working good, you know, in good weather, you can get as many as 90 to or more percent to come back. Get some bad weather and some bad factors and you could end up with 40 to 50 percent. So I typically average somewhere in the 70s throughout the year. And during the prime part of the season, um, get upwards of 85 to 90 percent. And, you know, more later in the season and summer and dearth and robbing season, run more down into the 60s and 70 percent and sometimes in the dreaded 50 percent. I've never ordered a package. I wonder if I'm missing out. Not really. I mean, they're, it's not that they're terrible. Um, sometimes they are. But uh, if you can keep your own bees alive or if you can source some good nukes, it's better to do that. Definitely better to keep your own bees. And swarms can be pretty good sometimes, but they can also be very swarmy genetics sometimes and come with a boatload of mites sometimes. And, you know, swarms are really variable. Some swarms are excellent. Some swarms are pretty poor. Yeah, Thunder Chief, I'll, I'll look into that and maybe see if I can find some stuff online and, and see um, if that's a good fit for what um, we're, we're doing. That I appreciate the suggestion. We're always looking for great speakers. Hmm. So looking at some of the questions here, just trying to make sure I didn't miss any up top. I've been going through a pretty good bit. I did my <clears throat> I did my first try at grafting. A few are capped, but they are not touching the jelly that's in the cup. Are they dead? Well, they sometimes will not eat all of the jelly. Sometimes they put so much in there, there's a little bit left over. Um, if there are some that haven't eaten any of the jelly, though, that is not a great sign. And, I don't, and it depends on what stage they're in. If they cap them, like just that day you looked at them, then they haven't had time to eat everything yet. So it, it just it kind of depends on what stage they're at and kind of, you know, I, I don't fully understand what condition the cups look like. Okay, here's a question from Amma GA Tech or something like that. My hive is one month old, started from a package and a horizontal, four full frames of brood. How much longer should I wait before inserting the queen excluder board to get honey production started? Well, if you don't have combs, 
then I want to put a queen excluder anytime soon because you want them to keep making combs and they don't like to draw foundation on the other side of an excluder. If you have combs, then you can probably put that in fairly soon. But I, I wouldn't rush it on the queen excluder if you have foundation. They, they, they still have some growing to do. And I don't know where you're at. It's, uh, maybe that GA is for Georgia, uh, which I would that means I would wait a little bit. I don't really know what your flow can, like conditions are. All right. Yeah, John, I didn't see this one from John up above or Natalie. I think and you speak up when you talk to Cayman. Apparently his hearing is a little off. It must be old age setting in. Um, but uh, yeah, Nat Natalie, uh, now she picks on me and probably will be taller than me before long too, which isn't that much of an accomplishment. I would like to clarify uh, being taller than me is not being tall. Um, however, that's probably the case. She's just 14 and I might be an inch taller than her. Maybe, maybe not. It's been a while. I saw her at the conference and I was still a little bit taller than she was. So not, not that it really matters. She'll probably wear some heels at the next conference just to irk me. Yeah, that is a pretty interesting logo right there, isn't it? I don't know who stuck that on there. I don't know what you're talking about, Natalie. I've never picked on you. If, if, if it feels that way, then it's just a huge misunderstanding. Totally. What things should we be looking for to tell if a hive is going to supersede a queen versus swarm? All right. Interesting. Interesting. So the tricky thing is when the bees swarm, they'll have cells on the sides and the bottom. And when, and so you can't tell from where the cell positions are. And then when the bees supersede a queen, they'll have most of the cells on the side, and they'll still have some on the bottom. Um, so it can it can be a little tricky to see what um, exactly is going on. A lot of it depends on timing to me. Um, what's the brood in there look like? Is there still a queen in there laying? Uh, you know, Gus, somebody answer this question. This I, I'm like running out of energy, I guess. I don't know. Brain fog. I feel like I should know an answer to this. I, I just, it's not coming to me. Hmm. A lot of it has to do with time of the year, though. I only have swarming really strong tendency in March, April, and May. So anything outside of that, I'm thinking super seizure. And a lot of it's colonies behavior, too. Usually when swarming occurs, there's a lot of flow going on, and there's packing of the brood nest, and there's good brood patterns. Usually in supersedure, there's poor patterns, and it's just it's a the colony doesn't look the same. Oh, Natalie knows me well enough to know that I don't mean any of it. She she she. Thank you, Don. Come on, Natalie, taking Don's side and Don taking your side. You guys ganging up on me, I tell you. See, if I wasn't picking on Allie, then she wouldn't know that I actually like her. You know, she's a good friend. But that's how I show people that, you know, I'm friends with them is I, I pick on them. And besides, she picks on me, too. Just because she's quiet doesn't mean she picks on me. I, there's been times I've had to just, you know, just go cry. You know, she picks on me so much. She's really, she's really talented, actually, at comebacks, I've got to say. She's got me quite a few times over the years, and it's hilarious. If she would just say more of it out loud, you guys would get a lot of laughter at my expense. It's it, She's got good jokes. So Kent Vernon said, would the conference be too much information for a rookie like me? I've only been at it for four and a half years. Oh, no. Um, even if you were a first-year beekeeper, it's not, especially this year. This year... I'm going to have double the speakers. So we're going to be able to focus 
on professional stuff, more, you know, so advanced stuff, intermediate stuff. And honestly, if you're a new beekeeper, I'm not one of those guys that believes that you should, you know, your first year or two, you need to be stuck reading beekeeping from dummies, okay? First year or two, you need to be watching, you know, some more advanced stuff on YouTube, and you need to be reading more advanced stuff as well. Maybe maybe you don't do queen rearing and actually execute it, but you can still learn this stuff. And if you want someone to stay at a beginner level, then you just feed them beginner stuff. If you want somebody to advance, I know people in their 30-year graft. You know, I didn't graft at three years, but I know people that do. They got they got the right type of mentoring and did a good job. It's not about how many years you've been beekeeping. It's really about the experience that you have and the education that you have. So our conference is really focused on taking beginners and anyone that's wanting to learn and give them the information they need. Now that I've got double the speakers, I'll be able to have a lot more topics. We're going to have someone who's a swarm expert talk about swarming. I've got um, Landy Simone, who's going to be talking a lot about her operation in New Jersey, which is um, like a sideline um, operation. And, you know, she's, I think she said she's 69 and still running um, up to like 100 hives. So obviously there's some stuff to learn from her. And it's not that you have to run 100 hives. I pick these people based on how competent they are. I don't want to learn from people who are not great. You know, I want people who are able to keep their bees alive from year to year and are so good. They're able to sell bees and are able to produce honey. And she does a lot of stuff like soaps and bombs and things like that on the side too. So we're going to have a lot of information in general information but if you're a beginner you can learn a lot here maybe you won't apply it in the first season but you're going to learn a lot of practical stuff and heck you're going to get a save on product too if you drive because i talked to premier foundation last week guardian bee apparel um talked to several beekeeping companies last week as we approach opening up the vendor um stuff and oh yeah can have some killer deals on product stuff that I can I never could have dreamed of being able to get when I was a hobby beekeeper hoping to have some pollen sub for like a buck 70 a pound buck 60 we'll have to see what prices do between now and then that's pretty darn cheap for you know buying it in small quantities Christina Meeks thank you so much for um, contributing to our YouTube channel and for being on so much over the years yeah, DP, they do. Where do you get merch with that logo? So, okay, this is the... Oh, yeah, we're getting real style in here. It's like the 90s all over again. Um, this is the 628 Dirt Rooster channel hat right here. So when Randy came to our first conference, um, he sold some of the, his merchandise there, and I was able to pick up this nifty hat. And he was at our conference this last year. Frederick Dunn will be there again. Um, we'll have Mr. Ed, Jeff Horshaw, um, several, well, Paul Kelly. We'll have a lot of B personalities, many, many, many YouTubers and just fun people. Always looking in to bring more. So if you have some people of interest you'd like to see, let me know. If I think there's something, uh, somebody, a lot of people like to see, we'll do that. Hmm. She's playing defense. Beekeeping with Natalie just retracted a message. Ooh, now I really want to know what that is. Probably something soul crushing. Hmm. Let's see. First book, Starting Right with Bees. How do I get rid of swarming a lot genetics? How do I get swarm? So bees that want to swarm a lot, well, you have to breed queens from the ones that don't swarm as readily. 
So this kind of leads me into another question I get asked. Should I raise queens from swarm cells? And I think the answer is maybe. Maybe you should. So queens that come from colonies that are a swarm early in the season and they're really not packed out and they haven't backfilled and they're just like, man, they're swarming ahead of everything else. And I've got colonies stronger than this one. Why are these bees wanting to swarm? I will not save queens from that unless you want swarmier bees. However, there's there was a bee yard this year I didn't get to as quick as some of the others. And the ones that were in doubles were fine. But I had left some in singles. And I didn't get back to the yard for a couple of weeks. And when I came back, they had plugged out with nectar and pollen. And between the lid and the top bars, they had built bunches of bird comb trying to find any space. And lo and behold, they backfilled. And they're raising a bunch of queens. That's my fault. They ran out of space. So if I was going to use cells from swarms, those would be the ones that I would use for the ones where it was like my error or, you know, they waited later in the season to swarm. We definitely don't want the earliest swarmy bees. Bruce, thanks for coming on tonight. Um, hope if you're still on here, have a good week. Yep. Subscribe hometown honey to Gus. Oh, yeah, Pierce. Um, so this year with the vendors, it's going to be crazy. So I'm going to have one room just for the vendors. So we'll have a um, lot more opportunities. Um, from what I understand, uh, we're going to have 170 10 by 10 spaces for that room. And, and a little change with that. So 170 10 by 10 spaces. So, of course, if somebody wants a 10 by 20, then I'll take up two spots. And there'll be some vendors like Premier Foundation, they sold a semi-load of foundation last year, and they already have half a semi-load committed, um, sold for the 2023 conference. So my goal is to sell two semi-loads of foundation through them this year. And of course, it's discounted and no shipping, all that jazz. But yes, um, Mr. Uh, Pierce, beekeeping equipment, we will definitely have um, you and uh, you guys as well. We, we were so thankful you came out last year. Came and will Etienne Tardif be at the conference? I am wanting to get him there. I've, I've sent him a message and I'm waiting for him to get back with me on that. I'm sure he's busy um, and all that snow, but um, it is my intention to have him this year. And if he won't come this year, the next year. Um, it sounds um, pretty darn sure as long as nothing crazy happens that we'll have Richard Noel as well. So my goal is to have Etienne Tardif, Richard Noel, uh, Ian Steffler, Bob Benny, Steve Rapaski, Landy Simone, Chris Warner. I'm um, going to have um, Rick Sutton talk about honey and showing honey. And, oh, let's look at the list back here. Frederick Dunn, David Peck. I think Cayman Reynolds, we might have him give a lecture or two. Um, Natalie with beekeeping like a girl. Uh, oh no, I mean, sorry, that's next year, next season. Um, Richard Noel and Paul Kelly. Um, so, and I've got another guy I, I, I may have as well, depending on what he says. So, trying to have everything from commercial level to most of it's not going to be commercial level, but I do want to have a commercial beekeeper there if I can get one. A little almond pollination, but we'll have two rooms going. So, if you don't want to learn about um, you know, some of the more advanced stuff, then you can go to the other room and hear that. And we'll be polling everybody and asking folks, what do they want to hear? So we'll be trying to, you know, get a better representation of what you all want. And we'll have double the topic so we can really balance it out nice. And I think we'll just stick to um, having the nice round tables out in that room and the, the sound quality. Um, I've got more speakers and I test, we tested the other room and the sound quality was good. And that room is even better, actually. We're estimating 1,500 people right now based on responses. So it'd be quite big. Came in the conference needs to last three or four full days. Ooh, maybe, maybe one day, Don. Um, but right now we'll just add a part of Thursday and see how that goes. Um, It'll be nice, though. Thursday evening, it'll be in the vendor hall, 
and we're going to see all the vendor stuff. And if anyone wants to buy anything, they can. It'd be a time just for networking primarily. No speaking on Thursday night. Just um, getting to take pictures with, you know, Bob or maybe Etienne Tardif if he comes and Ian Stepler, any of those guys. Um, I haven't been able to get in touch with Vino Farms. LaGrange, maybe you get in touch with him and see if he'll come to the conference and reach out to me if, about coming. That would be, it'd be interesting to have Vino there. Maybe you can bring a hive and show people and in person, that'd be interesting. Um, but yeah, um, going to make it a whole experience. Thursday night will be a lot of fun. Autographs, if you want, like a lot of people wanted Bob's autographs. He's like, I don't know why people keep asking me for my autograph, but he, he, he found it a little, I think he was a little embarrassed to a degree that people kept wanting his autograph. Well, I know he was a little bit. I was too. I remember when we spoke at Iowa together and people came up and wanted us to sign some autographs. And and then the people that put it on wanted Bob and I to sign the Hive tools and auction them off. And he's, they, and they asked us, how much do you think they were worth? And Bob and I were like, they're worth whatever this Hive tool was worth. And uh, lo and behold, they went for $500. So um, apparently I'm in the wrong business. Um, anyways, that it was, I'm sure it was just a donation to charity and just happened to have our name on it. Has summer been canceled in Minnesota? No, I hope not. Um, I think I'm going to be in Minnesota this year. It, it was probably just waiting for me to show up. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, we're going to have more stuff like last year. We had the uh, creamed honey demonstration and people could try on bee suits and a lot of we're going to try to make it even more interactive, you know, especially with um, less concerns with um, coronavirus and stuff like that. Um, I think a lot more companies are going to come out and especially now that they saw that, hey, we can um, do some business here. I think a lot of companies are thinking, wow, how can we make this more interactive and fun and trying to get some Got, I think I got four Canadian companies coming down right now. So that'll be really cool. That'll be really neat to see. The, you don't see a lot of Canadian stuff down here. So when can we get a ticket to the Hive Life Conference? The goal is to have the conference tickets available the first week of June. And currently, if nothing crazy changes, and I don't think it will, um, we're not seeing uh, much of an increase on the price of tickets where we've prices have gone up on inflation um, on a lot of things. However, based on how many people we think are going to be able to come and will come this year, the bulk buying is helping us save a little bit of money that kind of offset some of the inflation. So we're really hoping to keep the price very similar to what it was last year or identical. Um and also, I don't know how many people are interested in this, but we're looking at having it to where the meals are optional this year. So you know, that'll deduct, a, th those people will have a good bit deduct off, deducted off their ticket. So, you know, if you have two people and it's, you know, $40, $45 off per ticket, you know, that add up to saving $80, $90 um, for that couple, depending on how many people come. So we're looking at having that as an option. Um, seriously, I think that'll probably happen this year. So for, you know, folks that are on a budget and wanting to save a little bit more and not get the meals, which let's just be honest, the, I've had, I've had issues with catering. I tell you, it's so infuriating. Competition is so important. It's what made America and these idiots that run these conferences that let one person cater to them and one person alone. I think it's dumb. Because if we had two companies or more, they could be competing. Prices would be a little bit more affordable. And more importantly, while one says, I'm not going to do this, and I won't work with you or give you the time of day because you can only work with me and nobody else. The other company, if they had two of them, might be a little bit more agreeable to work with. And the caterers we have to work with right now, I went all the way out to Sevierville. It's like three hours from me. That was the only reason I went out. And we had a meeting with them. And the person that makes the decisions who we were supposed to meet with set his, sent his secretary instead. And the poor girl was between like a rock and a hard place because she, she can't make any decisions. I came out there so I could get clarification. The chicken didn't even show up. So don't worry. I've got a, I've got a remedy for that. We're going to let him have it. 
but yeah, this is this is this is um part of the things that you end up learning about running the conference. I never imagined doing this kind of thing. Well, see, yeah, you see, I, I want better coffee. That's one of the things we have been devilishly working with them on. They're raising the price for coffee. The first year we did our conference, we had unlimited coffee basically for everybody all day long within reason. I mean, basically, you could have all the coffee you wanted. It wasn't the world's best coffee. It was, it was good coffee. But the people let us do it ourselves. So we hired people to run the coffee machines. I love to do that again. I even gave them that option. And we're still in negotiations, but man, they are just not willing to budge on anything, which I'll get them one way or the other. So, but they, this, this place right here charges us over $3 an eight ounce cup of coffee. That's our rate. And I'm not buying 20 cups, 50 cups. I'm buying like, if ever, we did unlimited coffee for 1500 people, how much coffee do you think that is? Because you guys know, some of you guys don't drink just one or two cups a day. There's some guys watching this channel right now. They'll drink a pot. Imagine eight ounces, three dollars, more than three dollars. So I've calculated unlimited coffee for fifteen hundred people. We're pushing up to twenty thousand dollars on coffee. Just coffee. It's highway robbery. I won't do it. So I'll get to I'll get to that question just in a second, Noah. Sorry about that. I'm on a little bit of a rant here. Um. So basically what I, I, last year we did, if you bought a ticket, you got meals. This year I told them, I'm like, this is, you know, you can, you can pick or choose. Okay. How you're going to get it. We, I was, I was going to say, we will to keep it simple on us and, and also help them out. I said to the caterers, we'll get everybody to have a meal with their ticket. If you give us a killer price on coffee, either no price or under a dollar a cup, because we want to have that coffee available. It's fun throughout the day. I like to drink coffee, especially when you're listening to lectures, drink a bunch of coffee, all that stuff. So we're, we're trying to fight this battle. And they responded, you know, um, I said, or we are. If you don't do that, we are going to allow people to decide if they get meals or not. And I imagine that's going to cost you about thirty to forty thousand dollars if you if we allow people to do that based on the percentages that I think will not buy a meal with their ticket. And so now they have the decision of either taking it on the coffee end or on the meal end. So I'm going to get them one way or the other. They don't like me very much, but then again, I don't really like them either. So sweet tea and tacos. Hey, Phil, hope it's getting a little bit better up there in Canada for you. All right. So Noah, you had a question. Um, hey, Cayman, I'm about to make splits and have tons of stores. And if I add a frame of honey to my four frame splits, would you still consider feeding them sugar syrup as well? Yeah, just a little bit. Um, you don't want to plug them out, especially if you're using a queen cell. Um, that's going to take a little bit of time. So you don't want to plug up that um, comb for her to lay in. But if you have um, and it depends on if there's a flow going on too, Noah. So that frame a piece though, if you could give each one a frame, that would be wonderful. Um, it's always a relief to a young colony to have a reserve of food. They will grow quicker when they know they have extra. And what you could do on top of that is maybe just give them a little bit of thin syrup, like three quarters of a pound of sugar to one pound of water. And just give them a little bit. Um, right at the time, if you're introducing with queen cages, I love doing that. So stick that queen cage in there, put that thin feed on top, and that as they're consuming that, they'll actually help them accept the queen a little bit better. I don't like to put any scents in my feed though when I'm introducing queens. I just don't like it. We don't. I don't want anything blocking that pheromone production of that queen and that introduction period. So then come back. After you know she's laid for about seven to ten days, and see what the stores look like in there. And what I like to see, 
especially after she's laid for a little bit and starting to get a cap brood, I want to see just a little thin band of syrup or honey above the brood, but I don't want them putting any in between. So just, just kind of watch it. It's tricky this time of the year because you have colonies that can need feed one week. And if they run out of feed or get low on it for that one week, they could really go backwards and take a hit. But then the next week you got a flow going on. And sometimes it's just, it's that quick. And if you're feeding on top of a flow, then that's where you can cause a lot of issues. So that's all I can say is just kind of keep an eye on it, Noah. And, um, you know, I, I think you'll do a good job. You can learn a lot from getting in the hives. A little observation. You drink about 48 ounces a day, Castle Hives. Gosh, man, you know how much that's going to cost me? Uh, yeah. And that's, coffee is so cheap. I, it's ridiculous. The gal from Dice Honeybee Labs. Um, I don't know if I know the one you're talking about, Scott, but may have to look at it or something like that. Forget the coffee. We just need sweet tea. Well, sweet tea is um, a little bit more than that. I think it's like $4 a cup, uh, eight ounces or something like that. All right, LaGrange Bees. All right. I appreciate you. You're an easy keeper. You don't drink that expensive coffee. You know, and I even said to them, um, if you refuse to, you know, do the coffee, you know, will you allow us to do it? And if so, and if you charge, I mean, how much, what can we do to make this work? They're just not willing to budge, but I'm going to get them. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, an it's a crazy price and we have to pass at least a certain degree of the cost onto you guys. And you know, we don't want to have to raise the price per person, 10 bucks for coffee. I mean, and the thing of it is, because some people don't even drink it. Um, I don't know. It's, it's dumb. This, this location's got a lot of great things about it. It's a great location. Um, uh, the conference, the people that run the actual convention center are awesome. But the people they pick to do the catering are nuts. Mm. Hey, Jonathan Flint, um, can't buy tickets yet. We will be, the goal is to have everything ready for that by June the first week. And then the vendors um, will be signing up at that point too. This last year we had like 30. 35 vendors 36 something like that and get based off of what i'm seeing right now on interest and also the folks that are wanting to come back from last year i think we're already at 50 and we haven't even opened up registration yet so i'm going to guess that we're going to have 60 to 70 at least and it's going to be the vendor trade show is going to be sweet John Hill needs to have coffee and an extractor. I know, right? Yeah, Brian Reese, the original location there in Lebanon were great to work with and did let us do a lot of things. And what I loved about them is they let us do the coffee. And then the vendors for food, they had like 12 options for catering. And, you know, that was awesome. But the reason we couldn't stay at Lebanon anymore was because these conference centers are so hard to find an availability, especially for a conference as large as what we have now. We can't get the big rooms in that conference until Easter week, and that's not going to work. That's the trick that we kind of have. I mean, I don't like, I don't want to do a conference during the holidays, Thanksgiving to Christmas, um, for a lot of reasons. And I think a lot of people wouldn't like that either. You got a lot going on during that time of the year. And especially for those who are in the deep south, you don't really want to do a conference much after or out west. You don't want to do much anything after February. So we really have about eight weeks to put this on. And honestly, you know, I'm doing a pretty good bit of stuff in February myself. So there's about an eight week period we can get a conference in, and we take up a pretty good room bit of room now. So we've looked at other venues and it's very difficult. Very difficult to find something that'll fit the bill because either it doesn't have loading docks for the vendors. And that's something I'm really adamant about because these companies, we're, we're talking many semi loads of product. Just in two companies, I think three semi loads of product. So, you know, we've got to have docks. 
we've got to have easy access for the vendors and make it easy so they can give us discounts and stuff. And then on top of that, it's got to have, there's just, there's a lot to it. Um, I know you know that, but it's crazy. And the nice thing about Severeville though, is there's a lot of, the hotels are pretty reasonable and there's a lot of other things to do. So if you want to extend your stay, make a vacation out of it, there's a lot of things to do in the area and um, it's, it's fun. All right. Yeah, we're, we're, we're fixing, we're going to see what we can do and be a little creative. Yeah, I tell you what, California beekeeper Jose needs to bring out just some taco trucks. That's what he needs to do is bring some taco trucks. They will let us. Hey, I would opt out of the meals too. Black Rifle Coffee, that would be awesome if we could get them to do it. That, that would be great. I could do some marketing for them, too. It would be a kind of a win-win. Ohio State now sells the University of Alabama car tags. I saw one of those not too long ago. There's just Alabama fans everywhere. Did, um, can you send out a score sheet for the honey contest early this year so we know what the judges are looking for? Yes, that is totally going to happen, C.S. Steinbutt. Um, totally. We, I'm already working with the Honey Show people. I, it won't be available by June, but it should be available in summer. You guys should hopefully have six months to prepare for the Honey Show and rules and stuff. And it will be extended. It'll be a lot different. Our goal is to have people sign up, a good bit of them, on Thursday night. And also have the Honey Show people sign up Thursday night so the judges can quickly judge on Friday, have it an announced maybe as early as Friday evening. That's what I'm going for. And that way it can be displayed as the winners and be nice and, and pretty and organized all day Saturday and get pictures done. Um, we were just understaffed last year and some of it was just not knowing and some of it was uh, not knowing who to talk to about it. This year will be a lot different. Um, I'm not going to be doing near as much of the work as I did last year. I'm still recovering. <laughs> uh, how many people last year? So last year we had like a, little, a little over 900 people. Um, you count vendors, speakers, and everything. Um, I don't know exactly what the total was, but um, some people have said it was 1,000. I know it was not 1,000. Um, probably nine. If you count literally everybody from like me and Laurel, maybe 930, 950-ish. So actual attendees was a little bit below 900. Um, some of that was due to the weather. Um, there's several people that stayed home because of the, the snow. Well, we're, we're going to look into some sponsorships, too, maybe trying to get some, a bank or something, or that somebody that has more money than cents to, um, to sponsor the coffee. But $20,000 is a lot of you know, a lot of sponsoring. Well, and see, they won't let us invite a coffee company as a vendor. That We're not allowed to have any foods and stuff like that. It's, it's so retarded. Um, that's what happens when you get monopolies, though. It's just it's dumb. Bring your own coffee cup. Will that make the coffee cheaper? Nope, they won't do that either. Um, you know, and by the way, you did not hear this from me. I may delete this video later so they can't prove it as evidence. Um, but if people just so happen to sneak in some snacks and you know, a bottle of water or, you know, things like that, as long as you're not setting up a picnic and cooking food there, you know, and it's a, it's a big place. I mean, now it's going to be three rooms, massive conference. I can't do everything. I can't see what everybody's doing. So, you know, don't break the rules. Um, but, you know, whatever. So I keep getting talked to about peppermint candy, um, about using it in a YouTube video. I don't really know anything about that. I knew of a guy who used it in like Nashville area that was feeding it to his bees to produce peppermint candy honey. They would, you know, take it, dilute it down with water, and they would turn it into peppermint candy honey. But outside of that or protecting from beetles and other, other things I've heard peppermint will do, I don't know anything about that kind of stuff.
They, they love to eat them, but what's the benefits here? Hey, if I could get Elon Musk to sponsor the coffee, that would be awesome. That, that would be epic. Um, say what you will about Elon Musk, but, you know, he, I like the fact that, you know, he, he just does whatever he does. And whether I agree with it or not, he's true to that. And he also likes freedom and creativity and, and doing things that people say can't be done. More queen rearing products. I also like to see 10 frame boxes with slots for divisions like Chris Warner uses. All right. Um, that's a good idea. Hmm. There was some companies that brought queen castles. The trick is that our conference is quite a bit different than a lot of conferences. And that's one of the reasons why it's working, I think. Um, it is actually profitable for vendors to come to our conference. And some of them are a little shocked by that. They make good money. And last year they were a little caught unawares. A lot of them didn't even know who we were. I mean, it was our second conference for Pete's sake. So this year, um, a lot of people know who we are. We got videos and different evidence to prove. And a lot of vendors are ready. Um, so what I'm saying is they are going to, some, several of them are already gearing up for this next year and preparing. But definitely keep reminding me on the things that you all want throughout the season. And I talk to these co companies all the time and, you know, they want to earn your business. There were queen castles and three-way mating nukes and, and different things there. But to get anything specific um, and in quantity, pre-orders, um, a lot of the companies you can get 10% off woodenware. Um, sometimes you even a little bit more than that, depending on who it is. So, but yeah, just especially as we get closer let me know. But if you know a vendor who is coming or you want to come, let them know. And, you know, that they'll, they'll get it done, hopefully. Hmm. Also need more eight frame items to purchase. Well, and Anita, I, I totally am cool with eight frame hives and all that stuff. So don't get me wrong. But from a business standpoint, these companies look at it as a small percentage of sales. So they only and most of them were packed to the brim with product to sell. And that's where I think pre-orders or at least communicating to the companies that you want to buy from that, hey, I'm interested in eight frame stuff. Because these companies literally bring and base all this information off of either what they've experienced in the past. Um, or what they hear requested, you know, so the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So um, eight frame items aren't at the forefront of what they'll make money on. But if you can kind of communicate that to them and I can remind some of the companies as well. Um, but that is definitely something that you know we need to have there is eight frame equipment. And I know there was some, but it was very little last year. Free coffee with a meal ticket. I mean, I think it makes sense to me. I mean, the, the meals are expensive. I have a great idea for a vendor. How about I buy rock for a buck and get a free cup of coffee <laughs> by a rock? Well, um, you know, there's, there's going to be a workaround, Brian. We'll figure it out. Texas Beekeeper, thanks for coming on. Have a good night. Have coffee for free with donation for the youth beekeepers. It'll be a big hit. Did it with our archery club for our youth. Worked great. Yeah, maybe. Maybe we can figure out something like that. Um, definitely got to have that creativity type stuff. And I just don't want to increase costs if I can avoid it for sure. And uh, I like as much of the money to actually go to the kid program as opposed to feeding these gougers and rewarding them for gouging us on that coffee but we'll see what has to happen well there will be some coffee there uh, maybe a lot of coffee we'll just have to see how i got some time to, to, to maneuver just bend the rules that's right uh came in as blue sky b supply showing any interest i can plug the conference when i go there and talk to mel i know that they showed interest last year but they had a hard time like the shipping containers were stuck in california 
and they kind of they didn't have any other poly stuff and there's some other other things that they wanted to bring down and and i think there were some other concerns there as well and they just didn't feel like it was going to be um a good idea this last conference but i have um, heard them express interest and i um, hope that they will come down i think that we can do a good job for them they have a lot of fans so hopefully they will and it is my goal to have blue sky bee supply this year and mel and um, her husband seem to be really nice people and uh, we would love them to have them as part of our hive life culture that's that's really most of the fun for me is getting to meet a lot of these people for the first time and get to see who i'm buying from and and let me just say the vendors that did the best and it's not I'm, as far as best for our conference and they were not your big commercial companies your you know ones that you hear all the time they were the small guys the new companies the hungry ones they're the ones that gave us the support of the conference the most they're the ones that i got on the phone and said hey could you help me out i'm trying to get a lot of vendors at this conference and make it special they were the ones that agreed to it right away it was the old companies that were like eh, who is this guy and i understand that but i'm just saying it's those younger companies that are hungry for your business and hungry to be a part of the beekeeping community and um you know those those are the ones that excite me the most to see at the conference hey scott maxwell all right i appreciate the coffee donation right there appreciate it buddy i uh I, I promise I'm doing everything I can on the coffee front and I have some time and I, I'll do the best that I can. And it's not just the coffee. The tea is like, like the unsweetened tea is the same price. So we're going for both of them. We want to have hot tea, hot coffee available in quantity. That is our goal without having to charge anymore. Um, so we'll see what we can do. I could bring my mega Keurig. There is a back room. Maybe we can sneak that in there. It'll be kind of curious. Why Why is there 1,500 people going in and out of that room all the time? Cayman, did you hear about the fungi? I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word. Metarizirum. It sounds like uh, something Arabic. Um, I probably didn't get it right. Developed by Washington State University to kill the varroa mites. I have heard some about it in the past. Is there some new developments on that, Claude Soli? Is that kind of old information? Um, from what I understood, it was attacking bees in like a Petri dish. Not attacking bees. Uh, attacking and killing Varroa mites in a Petri dish. But I haven't heard much since then. And I've reached out to them and, you know, I it just, I didn't hear much. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, just don't worry about it. You know, if you if you sneak something in, I won't catch you. I'm not looking for that kind of stuff. Miller Bee Supply is awesome. So I haven't bought any of their stuff yet, but even their frames are made by them. And I've heard some good things from them. I haven't tried them myself, but maybe I will in the future. New Conference Center in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Just throwing it out there. Yeah, you do need to get back into beekeeping, wise and hunts, uh, honey bee sanctuary. Evidently, small high beetles don't like the smell of peppermint. I would say honey bees don't like the smell of peppermint. Peppermint essential oil actually is a little, it burns, you know, it kind of gives you that menthol kind of feel. It kind of can burn a little bit too. Um, but. You know, I, I don't know. I, that's kind of been, you see these things a lot over the last 20 years. I've seen so many things from, you know, peppermint oil to tea tree oil and um, certain multiple types of fungi to lemongrass this or use uh, sumac seeds in your smoker to kill varroa mites and just all kinds of things. And you just, and after you see so many of these things, it really kind of makes you um, calloused towards accepting new things and it's something i constantly have to try to keep an open mind about because a lot of times i hear these things and i think well that'll be another viral thing of the next beekeeping savior and we won't be talking about it five years from now 
you know, powdered sugar was a huge thing back when I got into beekeeping. Everyone was powdered sugar shaking their bees, and that didn't end up working. Um, didn't work at all. And you had to sh basically powdered shake the bees every day to just to get a halfway decent mite kill. And the bees hated it, and it was a pain in the butt. So we need to learn things for, about how to control things for sure. And I hope that we can discover more, but um, ultimately at the end of the day, it has to work and make a difference. Washington State. All right, well, everybody, I told Laurel I'd keep it around an hour tonight. Here we are. Three hours in, I've got actually a meeting tomorrow with um, the Hive Life Conference group um, and hopefully figure out some of these issues that we talked about. A lot of things going on. Um, let vendors know. Um, we are going to be doing a lot of different things this year, um, different, trying to have a lot more companies come down and, and companies from out of country. We have, uh, I know of three countries countries that are going to be represented as of right now besides the united states so we're going to try to make this more and more an international event so we can bring in unique products and bring in unique speakers so if there's a speaker you know that's not even from the united states let us know we'll try to bring them in if they're really good and we think they can help out and we want to hear what you think about topics and speakers and products and all these things and we appreciate it because that helps us hone our conference and make it more individualized and creative. So thank you guys so much. Hope your beekeeping is going good this year. So got a couple of questions I want to go, hit, go ahead and hit too, because it was last minute. Um, Pat Gooch, good to see you on here. Thanks, James McNally, for coming on. Um, here's a question from Luke. Do you feel that investing in a wax dipping equipment is worth it? I do. But, you know, I have thousands of boxes and I've dipped my lids and my two-way pallets and my double screen boards. So when you're dipping that much stuff, it's worth it for sure. But, you know, if I had 12 hives or 20 hives, I'd find it very hard to justify that. And I already had, okay, and here's another perk that I had. I already had this chicken scalder back when I was doing a couple thousand birds and processing them a year. Um, and I just was able to retrofit that thing and so I'd already made that expense years ago and had it just sitting in storage. So um, I do like it. I think there's an opportunity for beekeepers to go in together, maybe on that, like a bee club. However, I will say we'll have discounted wax dip boxes at our conference like we did this last year. Um, and they'll be wax dipped and just the way that I do them for 15 minutes. Any experience with APMA hives? Yeah, I've got 26, no, 27 of them, um, and they, they they work really good. They definitely help out during those cold buildup times of the year um, where bees can sometimes go backwards, but and help the colony regulate the temperature. They are pretty pricey, um, but they also have nice pollen traps that they come with, and they come with feeders. And when you start adding up some of the other, you know, they come with an excluder and a screen bottom board that's built in but it also seals off really good so when you start adding some of these perks together um you know it may be a good idea for you um appa may also comes to our conference and we'll have discounts there as well just like they did last year so um you know it's just they work good but bad bees don't work good in any hive ah they're actually moving forward developing a delivery method and getting epa approval claude is there a study or an article or something that you might be able to send to me i would really appreciate that if somebody has that uh, i'll try to look it up myself um, but that is interesting so if they're seeking for epa approval and a delivery method i want to know more about that absolutely they're getting serious so that's good to hear i appreciate that update claude and Oh, man lake boxes keep getting worse. Broke a finger off trying to get the joints to fit together. Yeah, that's the last 300 man lake boxes I purchased. I said, well, not doing that again. Uh, I used to buy them and they would just literally fall into place. And we're talking commercial grade boxes, not select grade. And about a third of the boxes now you have to pound them in together. And a lot of times you split wood. They're just, it's not the way it used to be.
Hey, Salty Bee Lady, thanks for coming on and be a part of our group tonight. And um, yeah, Laurel definitely makes a huge amount of this possible. Holy smokes, almost $30 per deep from Man Lake. I complimented you. That's all I said. Good things. Good things. Only good things. Ah, that's what make you a dipping tank from scrap metal for 400 bucks Canadian. That's pretty nice. I know, I know, Laurel. I'm sorry. I am on my third hour. I got to get off here. She's Laurel's walking in here and going. So that hour is running a little bit um, long in the tooth, isn't it? Oops. Oh, well. She knows I like this. And I enjoy this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Laurel was like, while you were in there talking bees with your bee buddies, I was out mowing the yard. Today at church, they had a, a, the service, like every fourth Sunday, they have the uh, Sunday morning, and then they have an extended, like, dinner on the ground, and they have um, a fourth Sunday singing, um, so they kind of converge that all into one longer morning, and that's, you know, Sunday evening tonight, so Laurel was mowing the yard while I was in here chatting bees and making uh, manure smoker videos. <laughs> that was interesting. We'll never do that again. Um, Lacan Center and Pigeon Forge. Um, I'll look, I'm going to look into that a little bit more. I have looked into that, Carson. The biggest problem is they're not really easy to get the, the vendors into. The vendors can literally drive. We can drive a semi into this place that we're in. It's very easy to do so. So we like that. And yeah, don't make Laurel mad. Mm -mm. I can make Natalie mad because she's far away from me. Um, that's still dangerous, though. Yeah, Hillco boxes kind of remind me of the old Kelly boxes, too. A little bit different, but uh, they're, they're good. I, I have 52 Hillco boxes. Yeah. I'm a new beekeeper. I added a frame feeder, but had to remove to, um, move to frames for it to fit. Move two frames for it to fit, but now there's too much space. Do I add a spacer to take up the space? Ah, Joe Jackson, I know your pain. So... Here's a tip on frame feeders. If you get a one gallon frame feeder, you can't hardly fit nine in there. And the B space isn't right if you do shove nine in there. Um, but then if you only have eight and there's a big gap in those combs of the edges will get fattened up or they'll build um, some, a lot of bird comb in between. If you buy, this is one thing from Man Lake that works pretty good. Um, that was kind of a backhanded compliment. I didn't really mean it that way. That's <laughs> funny. It's like a second nature now. Um, the Man Lake one and a half gallon frame feeder fits just about perfect with eight frames. The one and a half, you get the two gallon, it's too big. If you get the one gallon, it's too small. One and a half gallon is like the, you know, the three little bears, just right. Take my advice, came and just apologize and beg for forgiveness. I know. I have to all the time. A lot of times I'll beg for forgiveness and I haven't even done anything. It's just for stuff that I, uh. You know, get, uh, I just, I just know it's going to happen. Okay. I think about, it came and could a queen excluder under the bottom board box prevent them from swarming. It may delay it for a little bit, Bill H, but the problem is, is the queens shrink down significantly so they can fly. So a lot of times they can still fit through an excluder anyways, because they shrink down significantly. Not all of the queens can, but um, it, it could work. It could not work. I, I wouldn't trust it. Yeah, you know, I, I think we're going to have Lysin polystyrene and Apame at the conference. Um, I've never used the Lysin polystyrene. I have used the Paradise polystyrene. I don't really like the Paradise boxes, so I would probably go with Lysin or um, Better Bees B-Max. Um, the paradise, the B space is a little off and I get burr comb consistently between the bottom box and the top box and they tie the two together. So, um, but Joe Jackson on your frame feeder question, you could make a little feeder, a shim that could go down there and maybe, um, take up some of that space, like a, a division board or something. But, uh, I wish they just kind of make, 
this is so frustrating. These manufacturers a lot of times won't make things sensible. I don't, they, they just don't care about B space a lot of times. It's like they just make it their way and they keep making these changes. Man Lake changed their frames not too long ago and the B space is a little bit off and eh. B space, B space, B space. It makes it can make a big difference on how much they burr your combs up and your lids up and everything else. Hey, LaGrange Bees, you got their 30 frame extractor. Wow, that is a, a big upgrade. And, and everything license I've seen has been really nice. Um, we had a ton of license and stuff at the conference, and I was really impressed with it. Now, Dogwood Ridge really, um, I think they brought like $30,000 worth of license product, and it was really cool. I'd never seen that stuff before. Well, everybody, I've got to go. Got to go, or this may be the last. Good to talk to you guys. Hope you have a good spring, or if you're in another country, you have a good fall or whatever season you're in. Um, thank you guys so much. We'll be talking to you soon. If you have any questions, um, leave them below.